gentlemen, welcome to Ariel Helwani's MMA Show! Back in your life on this Monday, January 28, 2019. Hello again, everyone. I'm Mario Hawani. Welcome back to the program. Hope you're doing well on this Monday afternoon. It is a frigid one here in Bristol, Connecticut, and we have a lot to talk about. So I'm happy you're here. Hope you had a lovely weekend. I did. I went to Montreal. I was at a wedding. It was one of my best friend's wedding. I was so happy to be there, but it was also a very busy time in mixed martial arts, of course, because Bellator was back and it seemed like... And by the way, muzzle tov to my friend who got married this weekend, Julia. I'm very happy for her. So Bellator was uh, on this weekend, and it seemed like they had not been on the telly for quite some time, over a month, a month and a half to be exact. And they came back in a big way, of course, the culmination of the Bellator Heavyweight Grand Prix. And it ended in, I wouldn't say shocking fashion, because, of course, I think a lot of us thought that Ryan Bader was a favorite heading into the tournament. I think what was shocking was A, how quickly it ended, and B, that it ended almost the exact same way his fight against King Mo did. The King Mo fight lasted around 15 seconds. The Fyodor Milenko fight lasted around 35 seconds. But it was the exact same punch. Look at that. Lead left hook. That's the King Mo fight. That's not the Ryan. That's not the Fedor fight. Now here's the Fedor fight. Exact same punch within seconds. Unbelievable. What a moment for Ryan Bader. He is now the Bellator heavyweight and light heavyweight champion. He is the double champ in Bellator. He wins their heavyweight Grand Prix as well. And now he has a lot of options. And anyone who thought that his move from the UFC to Bellator, signing that big free agent contract, anyone who thought that that was a mistake, I, I hope by now you realize and understand that that was a huge move, a very smart, a very wise, a very savvy move by one Ryan Bader. It was a fun night as far as the card is concerned. A lot of finishes, a lot of big performances. Jake Hager, a.k.a. Jack Swagger, with his MMA debut now under his belt. He wins in a little over two minutes. But how about Henry Corrales and Aaron Pico? A firefight, if you will. An old-school Western shootout. Perhaps you can say an old-school shootout that one would see at the OK Corral. And Aaron Pico dropped Henry Krause, and then Krause came back and dropped him and then finished him. And once again, Pico lives by the sword, dies by the sword, still very young, still green as far as his MMA experience is concerned. Uh, some of the very best have lost and have come back. It's, it's no big deal. But I think that what's interesting about it is that after the fact, a lot of people say, oh, you pushed him too quickly. Oh, it was too big of a jump up from his last opponent fighting a guy like Henry Krause. Well, you can't have it both ways. We criticize Bellator for not pushing the likes of Michael Venom Page quickly enough. And then we criticize them for pushing the likes of Aaron Pico too quickly. Look, he dropped him. And then he got dropped himself because he was a little bit too overzealous and got caught. I don't think it was a mistake of a matchup. I think he'll learn from this. I don't think that Aaron Pico is overhyped. And a lot of credit goes to Aaron Pico for showing up afterwards, answering all the questions. You could tell he was hurting. You could tell he was sad, but he didn't seem uh, to shy away from any of it and answered all the questions. So a lot of respect for Aaron Pico, and I'm curious to see how he responds from all of this. Okay, uh, today on the program, we have a lot to discuss. We have a lot to discuss with a lot of different people. We've got a jam-packed show for all of you once again. And I will run down the lineup, and then we'll get to our first guest of the day because I'm looking forward to get this one rolling. Okay, at uh, 345, we're going to be joined by Demetrius Johnson. Look at these lovely people over here. Wow, there he is, DJ. This is amazing. Uh, the now one championship fighter who, of course, was the longest reigning UFC champion and for the longest time, the only UFC flyweight champion, no longer in the promotion. We'll talk to him about what transpired last weekend in Brooklyn, his thoughts on it all. And of course, life after the UFC. I know he was just in Japan doing some promotional stuff for one. He'll be competing in March. So I'm looking forward, as always, to catching up with one Demetrius Johnson. Henry Krause will stop by at 325. Looking forward to talking to him. First time that he's on the program. He has turned his life around, his career around since uh, joining the MMA lab in Arizona. Big win over Aaron Pico on Saturday. We'll talk to Darren Till at 305. He headlines the UFC's return to London, England on March 16th. I am looking forward to that fight. And I'm looking forward to talking to Darren Till and he'll be headlining that card 
against one Jorge Masvidal, who joins us at 245. Jorge Masvidal, a.k.a. Gamebred Fighter, not fighting one Nick Diaz, fighting Darren Till on March 16th. So we'll talk to him at 245. 225, we'll talk to Holly Holm about her return to action, a lot going on in her life, Mountain Dew sponsorship. There's just a lot, as always, going on in the life of Holly Holm, but I'm looking forward to talking to her because it's been a while. And she returns on March 2nd against Aspen Ladd, who's a rising star at 135 pounds. Justin Gaethje is returning to action on March 30th against Edson Barbosa in Philadelphia. We'll talk to him at 2.05. We'll talk to Fabricio Verdum, who was very busy last week, in case you missed it, being a very good Samaritan. We'll talk to him about that and where he goes from here. Of course, he is currently uh, suspended by USADA. Is he leaving the UFC? What's up with him? And the aforementioned Jake Hager, aka Jack Swagger, will join us at 125. Talk about his debut victory on Saturday night. But the story of the weekend was one Ryan Darth Bader defeating Fyodor Emelianenko in just 35 seconds. And as you see there, he now owns all the gold. The Heavyweight champion, the light heavyweight champion, and the heavyweight Grand Prix champion. They gave him two belts on Saturday, so now he has three belts. That's amazing. No one ever walked away with three belts. What a feather in his cap. He kicks things off for us this afternoon. He is kind enough to be joining us on the phone. Ryan, how are you? I'm doing great. What about you? I'm doing very well. Probably not as good as you. Congratulations on Saturday. I was just showing the two clips. Your finish against King Mo, your finish against Fyodor Emelianenko. It's the exact same punch. It's unbelievable. That that lead left hook. Mm. How, how like If I would have told you that you would have been able to finish two of the people in this tournament the same way in less than 40 seconds, I would imagine you would not have believed me initially, right? Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's uh, two guys that kind of keep their hands down, you know, with Fedor. He, he throws that right hand, and it makes him dangerous because you can't see his right hand. Um, and he throws hard, but he, he, he's exposed all the time, you know. And so uh, if you saw what we were doing in the back right before that, you know, when we were in camp, you know, that's that's the punch we uh, we plan on hitting him with, you know. And so, uh, you know, with his hands down his waist, you're going to try to time his right hand, throwing the right hand, or hit him with that left hook. And uh, just that first punch landed, and uh, you know, kind of uh, played out exactly like everyone wanted to. Prior to the King Mo fight, is that a punch that you used a lot in your career? It, it, I, you know, I'm not the flashiest striker, I'm not, you know, um, but I do some things really well as far as you uh, when I set some stuff up, my jab, uh, right hand, or left hook, or a takedown. It all comes from the same, same feint in the same place, and so. When I do faint, you don't know if it's a double leg or it's a left hook or right hand. And so uh, I think that kind of throws people off, you know, and, and I have different uh, different weapons from that that uh, little faint there. Um, it's just something like in this camp, I was hitting it. I was hitting a bunch. I brought in uh, an old training partner, uh, Daniel Serafian, and he just throws bombs the whole time. I, I, I kept landing that punch the whole time, you know, and then, you know, the coaching staff, and we all got together and, like, all right, this is how we're going to set it up. We're going to do this. Keep your hands down. Kind of let him run into it. And uh, um, like I said, if you were uh, if you were out in the back in the locker room right there, you know, watching we were doing warming up for this fight, you know, it went exactly the plan to a T. Are you surprised that he wasn't more prepared for it? You know, we were we were prepared to go in there and and, and basically getting a, a little scramble firefight for the first round, just like with Chell. Um, get him tired. I felt like, yeah, it'll be a little nuts, it'll be crazy, but it'll only benefit me in the long run if we go to second round or fourth round. You know, and so uh, um, that was the plan. We were going to make him throw. We were going to uh, get him tired and all that kind of stuff. But when I got in there, I can, I didn't know if I was going to be able to see his right hand. That's what a lot of people told me. Hey, the one thing about Fedor is he throws his right hand. You can't see it because he keeps his hand down. He was down. It's from the hip, all that. But I felt like I was, I was, he was about to throw it. I was uh, getting my distance, my timing down. And, uh, yeah, I just felt, I felt good in there. I, could, I felt like I could see everything. I, I knew he was about to throw that right hand. And, uh, you know, I, I just kind of faked it and obviously hit him with that left hook. What is it like now that you've been through this twice to go through, you know, this big fight. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of buildup. It's now the culmination of a tournament, but even the King Mo fight as well. And it ends so quickly. Do you feel 
obviously you're you're probably extremely ecstatic there's jubilation yeah excited. but like is it a little unfulfilling you didn't even break a sweat you go back to the, the locker room and you're like that's it like what is that feeling like because i can't imagine going through those nerves and it ending just that quickly with essentially one punch yeah hell no i'll take that uh, any day you know it's it's one of those things where it's, it could be potentially a five-round fight you know you don't want to go in there and fight for 25 minutes you know and so um yeah you have all the emotions and nerves you know you have the uh that added pressure of it being, you know, the Edward Championship, the Grand Prix, the finale there. I've been working, you know, so hard for this whole past year when it was announced and, and you started this thing. And then uh, on top of that, you're fighting one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. You know, and I, I tried to put that in the back of my mind. And I've been in there, I've experienced and so it wasn't a big deal. But, yeah, to get in there and get out, man, I'll take that any day of the week. You know, I had a three-round fight with me, me too, and that was enough. You know, I got, I got that in there, but... Anytime you get in there, you know, and to cap it off the way, the way it went with Fedor, you know, knocking him out, starting this tournament, knocking Kimo out, I'll take that for sure. Did you have a moment right before the fight? Because I know you spoke very highly of, of Fedor. Did you have a moment where you were like, wow, I can't believe I'm actually about to fight this guy? You were never in his weight class. Uh, I, I know you, you, you respected him, but it wasn't like you two were on this collision course. Did you have a moment where you were like, wow, this is pretty cool? It can, it. It popped up like during camp and the week before, you know, you're kind of laying in bed at night and that, that kind of reality hits you. You're like, man, I'm fighting Fedor in a week or, you know, fight week. You're, you're sitting there, you wake up, you're like, all right, here we go. And then, uh, um, one moment when we got to the, uh, we got to the floor in there, got to the venue and I was walking in and it was kind of the magnitude of the fight of how big it was. You know, I kind of, I had to check myself real quick and be like, Hey, it's just another fight. Right here. Just another fight. There was about 20 people in the locker room. The cameras were there. You know, um, Fedor arrived, and his whole team was there. Um, but the whole time, I, I tried to, you know, I, I told myself, I'm making it bigger than what it is. You're going out there. You're fighting Fedor, yes, but you're fighting, you're fighting, uh, you know, January 26th Fedor, another guy across the cage from you. Don't put him on a pedestal. And so that's, I kept just reassuring myself the whole time. And, and uh, I feel like, now in my career, obviously, mentally, the biggest thing, which in the past might have been uh, a little killy too, is uh, I got over all that. You know, these big fights I've had before, come up short. But, you know, this time I just kept on reassuring myself, telling myself, it's your time. This is your legacy right here. You get to fight Fedor. You know, and uh, I kept everything out of my head, just went in there and uh, let myself succeed, basically. D did you feel like in the past... When, when, when it was a bigger fight, when the stage was bigger, that you would let your, your, your head kind of take over and, and you'd overthink things and, and crumble into that pressure? Do you feel like that's something that you really had to work on? Yeah, yeah. yeah to be honest, probably. You know, it's just one of those things where uh, it, it's not even – I always believed in myself and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, at, at some point, I want to say probably after my last loss as far as – the pressure, all that kind of stuff with uh, Anthony Johnson. I said, you know what? I'm never going to sort of change myself. You know, I went out there and I rushed your takedown and it just didn't didn't fight, basically. You know, and so ever ever since then, I always go back to that moment. You know, when I say, Do you want to feel like that again? When I walked out of that cage, I was embarrassed. I was, you know, I felt like shit. And it just, I always go back to that moment and say, Do you want to feel like that again? You know, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to the people at the time. You know, into you to get this job done and, and go out there and, and uh, leave it all out there. So ever since then, you know, I've, I mean, I've, I've won every fight. And uh, um, it was a huge – getting that mentality and uh, bringing that into the, into the you know, fight night has been uh, a game changer for sure. You know, it's crazy. The, the Anthony Johnson fight, the anniversary of that is uh, three years – in two days, in two days, it will be a three-year wow. anniversary. You get what you, I'm sure you get what I'm saying here. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Does that does it feel that like, is crazy? Feels like a lot longer than that in a weird way. Yeah, you know, and, and that, you know, you, you have your losses. Obviously, we don't like to lose and all that kind of stuff. But if I look back through my career and look at those losses, yeah, I wish I would have won these bigger fights, or whatever. But um, it got me where I am, and in, in, in you know, corny, or whatever. But you learn from every one, and that last one. It, it just kind of, kind of snapped as far as uh, you know. I gotta, I gotta change whatever it was that was holding me back. 
you know, and, and uh, I did that, and, and we've been undefeated since then. And so, um, obviously, don't like to lose, but it was a good thing. You know, there's a blessing in disguise right there. Have you ever felt, in your entire athletic career, have you ever felt more confident than you do right now? I mean, things are going so well for you. You went through a whole tournament essentially without getting punched. And I, I don't know if Beltor keeps these stats, but I've, I've asked around, and it really does seem like in the Mitchell fight, do you remember actually getting punched once? There's a moment in the second no. round where he, he, no one landed a punch, correct? Yeah, no, to be, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I got hit with Latifi a little bit. Like, he, I guess he kind of dropped me, you know, back in uh, – a couple of years ago, whatever in the UFC, but yeah. you know, Phil Davis might have hit me with a couple, you know, jabs or a right hand here and there. But yeah, I haven't been punched in years, you know, and it's it's one of those things where longevity in the sport and all that kind of stuff, and I'm feeling great, and my body feels great, especially when you're not taking any damage, you know. And to go through this this tournament, let alone a heavyweight tournament, you know, and uh, not get punched, not get punched, and then cap it off with beating the Andrews at this one time. Um, Great run, not done, but uh, that's pinnacle right there in MMA. And so to go back to my initial question, have you ever felt more confident, even dating back to your college wrestling days, I don't know, high school wrestling, have, in your athletic life, have you ever felt more confident than you do right now um, about your skills? No, and it goes back to what I was saying about the, the mental aspect, catching up. Like I'll, I've always had the physical gifts. I've always been a good athlete, you know, growing up as a kid, all that kind of stuff, you know, wrestling. Um, and then getting to MMA, I got into MMA and I was a wrestler. And I had no idea what I was doing on my feet. Probably till, to be honest, and be comfortable till the was fight. And, wow. uh, you know, and, and you get thrown into the, you know, the deep waters there. I was on the ultimate fighter, won that, and you get thrown into the OC and, and uh, was undefeated for a while and got top guys, you know. And so, yeah, I feel confident, I feel good, but the, the mental aspect of it all, you know, the, I was I was fighting for the heavyweight title, fighting Fedor. I had a smile on my face in the back. I was having fun, you know, and, and I had those little little checks and balances in my head in the back. Like I was saying, you know, you never I never want to feel like I have I felt, you know, in, in my last loss and that kind of stuff. And and uh, it, it just just kind of I feel free, you know, the, these last couple of fights. I I know I have the abilities and so. Um, and I work, you know, I'm one of the hardest workers in the gym there too. So that, you know, but walking into the cage and knowing that you put in the work and I just kind of, I just let it go from there. Smile on my face, walk out, most confident I've ever been, you know, and then I, I think the results show. When they first approached you about this tournament, were you into it or did you have to be convinced to go up from 205 to heavyweight? So when, when I, uh, when I left the UFC and came over, uh, came to San Jose and met with, uh, Rich and Scott Coker, and, and you know they asked. That's what I like about it too. They asked, like, "Are you open to do some different stuff? Maybe fight in Japan? Maybe go up to heavyweight?" And I said, "Yes." You know, and I, I want to have these big fights. I want to do something different. You know, and I was open to something like that. So when they came over, and uh, we were talking about the heavyweight channel, well, we didn't know who was going to be in there or anything. You know, we immediately just said yes, and then we kind of watched that bracket fill out. You know, they literally did not, did not have one name, you know, when we said yes. And so, um, you know, it, it just looking back from that moment to where we are now, you know, it, it was a it was a it was a fun fun time, a cool run, and, and you know, it takes all the the hoop along on Jackson for the title shot, kind of out of the picture, yeah. going there. What I came up in in the, in the wrestling you know, we're all the a bracket, you know, and, and you win, you move on, you win, you move on, and so is a champion. And so, you know, it was fun. I, I got to be motivated the whole year. I knew when I was fighting. I knew potentially who I was going to fight. And uh, get my head down, did the work, and, and here we are. And I feel like symbolically that's probably the most beautiful part about all this because when I think back to your UFC run, in particular towards the end, I feel like that really defines the end of your UFC run. Like you kept having to maybe do things that you weren't uncomfortable doing, jockeying for position, trying to campaign for a title shot. Yep. Isn't this like th this must have been so much better for you and, and, and so it feels so much freer that you don't have to do any of that, right? Like the juxtaposition of the two experiences. Uh, I would imagine at some point must have hit you like, wow, isn't this so much better than how it ended with the UFC? Yeah, I mean, you get, you get to go out there and compete, and, and and it takes everything else out of it, you know. And I, and I get it, but I, you know, I, 
I like the seducting, you know, here and there, but it's it's become you know, you used to have the guys that were good at it and, and that's what they did, whatever, but now it, it's a new normal. You know, you you have to you have to shit talk, you know, and it's only a matter of time until it catches up with you. You know, Connor did it great and but he backed it up. You know, he backed it up also. Um, you know, so these other guys that are coming out and just that that's what they're they're starting starting with immediately. It's just gonna catch up with you. You know, and so for me, this tournament was perfect. I'm not a shit talker, you know, and, and there's a lot of respect there. And then, you know, fighting Fedor, he, you know, he, he's a, obviously a great fighter, but he's a good person, you know, and, and he's got nothing but respectful. So it was just, it was a nice change of pace. You go in there, you win your fight, you move on, and then, uh, you know, you're fighting for the heavyweight championship. I think it's Fedor, you know, who's respectful, um, you know, and, and, it was just an amazing experience from uh, top to bottom. How much did you weigh on Saturday? So on Saturday, we uh, we weighed in. Constantly does a uh, you know the fight day weigh ins or whatever in the locker room. I was uh, I was actually two twenty four. Okay. So I was at uh, uh, two twenty eight weighing in in camp. I was at I was two thirty five, but but my body just knows that it's fight time. So if we get get to uh, you know fight week and all that, and uh, I kind of shed a. Uh, Probably five pounds. I don't know where it comes from. It just just comes off. I don't know if it's just me uh, amping up, whatever, or, or the mental drainage of going through and, and doing fight week and having a fight looming. But uh, yeah, two twenty four on Saturday. Do you plan on defending both belts? Yeah, we'll see. Well, uh, keep it. I got to get with both of us. I have one fight left on my contract. You know, we need to do a, a new deal here. I'll, I'm having a great time, obviously, in both. I want to see you. Um, but I got to be incentivized to sit, you know stay up here at heavyweight for sure, you know, and, and fight these big boys and defend that belt. You know, I want to defend both, you know, and uh, um, I think they're open, open to it. You know, I don't think there's a there's a ton of clear cut contenders at two five, mm-hmm. and so I, I I feel like I have the ability to hold on to that belt for for a while without it being defended. But we'll see. We'll get with Bellator and. and you know, if they want me at heavyweight, and uh, if I get incentivized and all that kind of stuff, I'll do whatever they want. Are you planning on fighting at your contract and testing the waters again? No, like I said, I want to do I want to do a new deal. Uh, basically, now. Okay. You know, I have one fight. I have one fight left. I have a little champions clause, whatever, in my contract. But you know, uh, I, two division champion, the light heavyweight belt, the heavyweight belt, and you know, if they if they want me to do something in particular um, as far as defend the heavyweight or whatnot. Um, let's get a new deal done. I'll, I've been having a great time with Bellator. Um, I want to stay there. But, you know, that's going to happen first. There's no part of you that says, I wonder what the guys in Las Vegas are thinking? You know, it's obviously it's a, it's a selfish sport, you know, and you're in business for yourself. But, but like I said, I've been treated well, and I think I'm going to be – Treated very well after this um, with the tour, and so uh, I haven't even really had those thoughts, you know. And like I said, we're we're going to come to the table here and and go through all the hoopla with that. And uh, if they make me really happy, literally, I have no regrets. I'm not even thinking about that at all. I'm happy where I'm at, and uh, definitely hoping we get it done. Okay, and and just curious, it seems at least to me at 205, I know you spoke briefly about the 205 division, maybe there's no clear-cut guy. I feel like the biggest fight that they can make for you right now is Tito, that rematch of the fight that happened at UFC 132. Um, And I know you were asked about Tito, and I think you said, like, oh, you know, he has to come back and sort of prove himself. Do do you not feel like as far as, like, big fights, a rematch against him would be the biggest right now for you? Am I wrong in thinking that? Oh, yeah, hell yeah. I I would, you know, if that... I was just saying that because I, I didn't know if they would ever take that right away. But hell yeah, I would take that immediately. You know, um, I, that's why I came over. I came over to Bellator. That's why I sat down and they were asking if I was open to do stuff like that, like Japan, heavyweight. You know, the, that's the thing. I'm open for these bigger fights. You know, um, I don't want to. You know, with like the 205 division. You know, I don't want to go down there and fight. You know, well, I I, didn't, I don't know the guy's name, but like the the Russian guy. He, he's a good fighter. Nobody knows his name. You know, I want these big, I want these bigger fights. I'm at the point in the career 
especially, you know, being a two division champion, coming out here and doing this heavyweight tournament. I was, um, you know, every time I walked out, it was, it was, uh, it was a huge fight because it was, it was, uh, it was not just one fight; it was part of the whole tournament and all that kind of stuff. And so, for me, yeah, those are the fights I want. You know, the Tito's. You know, uh, you know, a big heavyweight fight. You know, and I want to, I want to defend my 205 belt for sure. But I don't want to just, you know, fight a a guy nobody's ever heard of. You know, uh, I don't know. Well, definitely, if Tito. Uh, if they would make that fight, I definitely, definitely want it and take it. Last thing: does does Chael Sonnen constitute a big fight? Is, is that a big fight? Yeah, no, I, yeah, no. I, I, uh, Chael would be a big fight. You know, he he's got his, uh, you know, he's got his fans and all that, and uh, you know, it, it that it goes back to the same with Tito. If if Bellator can justify putting Chael into a two hundred five pound title fight. You know, after he just got smoked with, uh, you know, with Fedor, I'm all for it. If they can deal with it, I, I'm all for it. All right. For now, enjoy the belts, Ryan. What a story. Unbelievable. And I feel like anyone who, as I said at the top, anyone who questioned your move from the UFC to Bellator, uh, I don't think they have a lot to say on this Monday afternoon. This has worked out very nicely for you, and I'm very happy for you. It's nice to see you with all that uh, all that gold, all those belts, a really cool moment on Saturday. So enjoy the victory. Congratulations. Thanks for stopping by, and good luck with your contract negotiations and from where you go from here. Absolutely. I appreciate it. All right, we'll talk to you soon. There he is, Ryan Darth Bader, the Bellator heavyweight and light heavyweight champion who won on Saturday in just 35 seconds. We showed you the clip uh, moments ago. Beat King Mo in the first round of the tournament in 15 seconds. Comes back with a unanimous decision victory over one Matt Mitrione in the second round and then defeats Fedor Emelianenko in just 35 seconds on Saturday. Uh, in the end, so Bellator doesn't have a fight metric or any sort of official stats provider to the best of my knowledge, but I did ask the team here in in Bristol who do look at the stats and who do follow these things, and they said that there was maybe one sequence in the second round of the Matt Mitrione fight where he may have been hit with a punch. Other than that, you can pretty confidently say that Ryan Bader went through this entire tournament without getting hit once. That is absurd. King Mo, Matt Mitrione, Fyodor Emelianenko. Three heavy, two heavyweights, one middleweight turn, light heavyweight turn, heavyweight. Um, still absurd to not get hit once. Unbelievable. He has won 12 of his last 13. He has won seven in a row. He has beaten everyone that Bellator has put in front of him. And this idea that Ryan Bader is second class, this idea that, you know, he couldn't hang in the UFC. He would be a top contender at 205, no doubt about it, um, in the UFC right now. And I like Ryan Bader at heavyweight, I must say. He is quick, doesn't have to cut a lot of weight, obviously. Um, he's he's fighting at 220-something. That's not bad at all. This is a nice interesting twist his career that I think a lot of us weren't expecting. So that's the Ryan Bader story. That's what happened in the main event. Um, and overall, it was a fun night as far as Bellator is concerned. Friend of the program, AJ Agazarm, lost in his uh, MMA and Bellator MMA debut. Um, a not very spirited affair. He ended up losing via una- excuse me, split decision against Jesse Roberts. Um, but also Juan Archuleta defeated Ricky Bandejas in a very close fight. Um, he won via unanimous decision. And I told you earlier that Henry Corrales defeated Aaron Pico via knockout in just a minute and seven seconds. In a matter of moments, we're going to be joined by Jake Hager, who made his uh, Bellator and MMA debut on Saturday. He defeated J.W. Kaiser in two minutes and nine seconds via arm triangle choke. Of course, Jake Hager, a.k.a. Jack Swagger, formerly of the World Wrestling Entertainment and formerly of the great state of Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma, a decorated wrestler from that university who ended up going to the world of professional wrestling and was there for quite some time before leaving and 
deciding that he wanted to try his hand at mixed martial arts. This is something that had been in the works for quite some time. You'll recall on my old show, he... Uh, he, he made the announcement, he flew in, he was in studio to make the announcement that he would be transitioning to mixed martial arts. And I think a lot of people thought, all right, let's see how this goes. You know, we've seen the Brock thing, we've seen the CM Punk thing, we saw Dave Batista try his hand. And it took over a year for him to finally step foot in the Bellator cage, but he did it on Saturday and, uh, and looked strong, looked good. Uh, generated a lot of buzz. It was really cool to see a lot of the uh, WWE superstars tweet about him, show support before and after. And even though he is uh, just 36 years young at this point, uh, he he wants to give it a go. I understand from his uh, manager, Danny Rubenstein of Ruby SC, that they want to get right back in there. They want to fight in around three months or so. So I'm looking forward to talking to Jake Hager uh, in a matter of moments, and he was, uh, I guess, walked out to the cage by the great R Truth, Ron Killings of uh, WWE fame, and uh, formerly of NWA, TNA, and prior to that was a uh, WWE guy as well. What was his name back then? Back in the day, like his his initial his initial run in WWE. Now uh, the name escapes me. But anyway, that was cool. They brought him out. He was singing. He was rapping, and they 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 kept the whole We the People gimmick. It was uh, it was a nice little nod to the past, but also a fresh start for one Jake Hager, who is standing by and joining us right now via the phone, I do believe. Jake, how are you? Hey, I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure as always. Congratulations, Jake, on the victory. Congratulations on finally making your MMA debut and looking as good as you did. Uh, a couple of days later, are you happy with what you did out there on Saturday? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I'm very happy. I, I feel vindicated. Uh, to say the last two years have been challenging at times is, is an understatement. So very happy with what happened Saturday. When you say that you feel vindicated, do you feel that way because maybe you got the impression that a lot of people didn't believe that you would actually go through with this? Oh, yeah. A lot of people, uh, you know, didn't think we were serious, you know, thought we were playing games with it. Um, but that's just because they knew me more as Jack Swagger and not Jake Hager, who's wrestled since he was five years old. Okay. So you felt like you had something to prove. You had a bit of a chip on your shoulder. Uh, I mean, I think anybody who sits in that octagon has a chip on the shoulder, has something to prove. It kind of takes that mindset to go in there and calmly say you're going to war with someone else. Um, but me, I feel more vindicated because, you know, I took a major pay cut for that exact opportunity to step in the octagon. And I'll be honest, there were times where it was, it was challenging, where I would say to my wife, oh, I shouldn't have left, you know, and mm. she would remind me why we did. And uh, Saturday was awesome because of that. Could you give me a, a sense how big of a pay cut it was? Uh, well, you know, uh, you know, the independent wrestling is very high right now, and it's growing, but... Uh, you know, to go from, you know, WWE where I was working full time, 200 days a year, where every day you're getting paid because of that. Uh, it, it, it was, a, it was, uh, enough to like take about a year and a half to recover from, wow. uh, as in a sense of like adjusting your normal lifestyle. Okay. Um, as far as the experience goes, like fight week experience. Now we're talking, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just leading up to the fight. We'll get to the fight in a second and being in the back and all that. But the whole experience of going through with the fight, big fight, L.A., all that stuff and more. Did you enjoy the process? Yes, I had I had a great time. I had I had so much fun. And a lot of it was, like you said, you know, my friends from, uh, you know, the past 12 years come out and really stand up for me. Um but a lot of it, too, was because uh, I knew I was ready, and so I could just sit back and enjoy it because this is cool. Uh, fight week is cool, and so I really was able to sit back and enjoy it. How would you compare the nerves um, that you, or the feeling that you were you know, experiencing in the back moments before walking out, an hour or so walking out, to what you would have experienced before a big wrestling event, a WrestleMania or something like that. Obviously, it's a different exp- you're, you're about to do something completely different. Um, how would you compare the two? You know what? I, I would compare them similarly. 
Oh. I uh, I definitely relied on my experience, like wrestling at WrestleMania, wrestling at Division One national championships on big stages, uh, to get ready. You know, because it's on television, so you can definitely know. You, you can relate to like, okay, we're going to be on in 45 minutes, so you know how to set up your warm up. Um, but then at times there's difference. There's no comparison as far as the pure adrenaline it takes to step in and do war like that and prepare yourself mentally. Um, uh, it, it's, you know, the the television part is similar, and then the rest is different. Uh, were you more nervous than you expected? Uh, m- my coaches complimented me, said that they could not uh, believe how calm I was. Um, you look at me in the cage, and I almost feel like I was smiling most of the time before the fight started. Um, I was really enjoying it, like like really enjoying it. Like I had a good time. I thought it was fun. Um, I was very zoned in on my opponent. I could just, I didn't hear any of the crowd. Um, I was just focused on him. And I knew that I was about to go to war and that it was going to be fun. Um, I mentioned earlier that your old friend, R Truth, Ron Killings, walked you out, sung his song as you were making your, your, your entrance. How did that come about? Uh, you know what? Uh, the squeaky wheel uh, <laughs> gets the oil. So uh, we had the idea when I left. Like, oh, wouldn't that be cool if, you know, you played your music while I came out to do MMA, kind of just sitting around talking about it for so many years now. Um, And so we just asked, and uh, Mr. McMahon uh, graciously, uh, you know, said he didn't have a problem with it. He knew um, Ron Killings, our truth is a WWE guy, and go ahead and promote your music because it's great music, and it was just a cool opportunity where two best friends got to come together. Bellator uh, was awesome about it. They, they they jumped at the chance to do it, and uh, gosh, man, he looked like a star out there. Yeah, it was very cool. Um, did you actually speak to Mr. McMahon before the fight, or did he send you a message? What's the story there? Ah, uh, yeah, he just sent, right, uh, sent me a text message and said, good luck, don't lose, you know, <laughs> ha ha. <laughs> what is your relationship like with him these days? Uh, you know, that was the first time I had talked to him uh, since uh, since we had left the company. I'd been in touch with so many people, uh, you know, from talent relations and whatnot uh, since I left. Uh, we left on a good note. You know, we just disagreed about one thing. And uh, other than that, you know, obviously uh, they like me. Otherwise, they wouldn't let their talent come uh, to one of the coolest entrances in MMA for me. Right. Well, what did you guys disagree on? Well, I, I mean, I left because I felt like I wasn't able to showcase my talent, showcase, you know, that I am a wrestler since five years old and that I can dominate. Um, but ultimately, we're all doing this for money. So I thought I was or something and they didn't agree with that and then i told them i would leave and go do mma and i demonstrated my value on saturday night so you pr- you were proven right uh, thank you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so you so you go out there you actually fight you do what you had to do was that how you thought the fight would play out did you think that you'd be able to submit him rather quickly uh you know over the last two weeks um my my ground game really improved, and so that became a major focal point of the strategy. Um, I definitely wanted to get him against against the cage quickly, and right from the beginning, he almost put his back on the cage, and so I I was like, oh, this is great, but what's he trying to do? So I thought he was trying to sucker me in and get a quick one two on me, um, which he did. Like uh, you know. You know, I just want to say the best about J.W. Kaiser. I thought he was a class act. Um, he definitely had very fast hands, and he surprised me with a, a quick combo there right before I got him mm-hmm. to the cage. But I wanted to use the cage to take him down, and uh, I had a series of submissions that I was going after. Did, did he Did he ring your bell at all there? It didn't ring my bell. Uh, it, it bloodied my nose. Okay. The first one. The first one bloody my nose, so he definitely got a, a good shot in on me. Uh, you know, but uh, I was able to take it and just keep moving forward. Uh, it, it, I I panicked just one second when you see my knee go down when I had him up against the cage, but then the ankle pick came right there to me, so it, it worked out even better than trying to finish a double leg. Did you speak to Scott Coker after the fight? 
Yeah, yeah. I happened to run into Scott Coker as we were both leaving. <laughs> he asked me if I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a Scott question. Um, but overall, it seems like he's very happy with what you did. You know what? I think we all knew it was going to make a big splash um, in the wrestling world and in the MMA world. Um, but I don't think anyone expected the outpouring uh, love and just uh, coverage that it got mm. from so many, uh, not just wrestling fans, but also like a lot of media. And it was really cool to be a part of. Definitely stroked my ego. <laughs> 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 oh, I feel like a top guy. Wait, wait, can't say that. Um, but it was really cool to like have that coverage and to really just be myself and have fun with it and, and enjoy it. So do you want to do it again? Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to fight in three months, uh, keep the momentum going. I'm already in shape. Um, I feel like I want to fight top guys. I know I have a ways to go, but it's exciting. Where am I going to be in six months? Where am I going to be in a year? I, I think I'm going to jump levels very quickly now, especially since I had that first uh, fight under my belt. And uh, with an 82-inch reach, it's going to be yeah. hard to hide from me. So yeah. I, I, hope, I hope to learn how to utilize that to the maximum capability. And with Bellator, do you have a multi-fight deal? Yeah, we have we have six fights on this contract. Okay, um, but you know we can always renegotiate. That's true. Are we going to renegotiate after the like after this one for the next one? Is that the plan? Uh, you know, I have to talk to my great agent yes. Danny Rubenstein, yes. who did an amazing job of setting this all up for me, finding the perfect company for me, Bellator, and like just making magic happen, like Danny Rubenstein does. Yes, Ruby SC, where dreams are made. <laughs> oh man, where <laughs> dreams are made. Um, okay, so you, so you want to you want to actually do this? Does that mean that you're taking a break from the wrestling stuff, or are you going to do them both? Because I know you're still very active on the indie scene. Yep, yep. Um, right now, this is going to definitely be my focus. I know independent wrestling is really changing right now, and it's really exciting to be a part of. And so I, I don't want to miss out on any of that. But I think if I can focus, like I said, for the next six months a year and almost stay home and train and keep doing what I did for the last year and a half, which was getting off my ass and working, um, I can really turn some heads. I mean, I want to be Bellator heavyweight champion. That's the goal. So, uh, you know, I'm going to work for that. So in your mind, how long do you think it would realistically take for you to actually achieve that goal? To get ready to fight a a champion like Ryan Bader, yeah. you know, I would say a year to a year and a half, I could be ready for that. But wow. at the same time, I might be, uh, I might surprise myself and really jump some levels here um, very shortly. I'm very confident in my wrestling. Um, uh, definitely have areas to prove on in my striking, but I'm honest with myself and I'm working towards that every day. So it's going to be hard to stop. To be honest, a year, year and a half to get to somewhere, you know, like like where Ryan Bader is currently, that's not that long. I, I was expecting you to say a little longer. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's a small window to do this. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, thir I'm 36, turning 37. Uh, my body is in the best shape ever, so it's responding to everything I do. So it's uh, kind of like one of those magical things. We'll wait and see where it goes. Okay. And by the way, we're, we're looking at your picture right now. You, you did stick with the We The People gimmick, if you will, and you did have the hand over your, your, your heart. Um, why did you decide to do that? And did you have to get some kind of permission to do that from WWE? No, no, no permission. We The People is public domain. You know, okay. it's, it's any, any American, you can use that. Um, I wanted to embrace my past. Um, I felt like I was more known as Jack Swagger, so it's easier to continue that brand. Mm -hmm. And hopefully one day, as we discussed in the past, I'll fight under Jack Swagger. Um, even though Jake Hager's pretty cool, yes. I, I, got some, I got some nickname ideas that would go with that. Um, but ultimately, I wanted to embrace my professional wrestling past because I feel like being a professional wrestler has definitely made me a better MMA fighter. I feel like because I wrestled at WrestleMania and some of the biggest arenas in the world, Madison Square Garden, Staples Center, I was able to handle Saturday, even though it was my first fight, I was able to handle it like a pro, go out there, cool as the other side of the pillow, and take care of business. So 
why why run away from that? I agree. Now, why couldn't you go as Jack Swagger for this one? Uh, because I, I don't own the intellectual property rights for Jack Swagger. Okay, you're working on that. Yes. Okay. You feel confident you'll get it? Uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> a lot of legal talk, but I, I got a great lawyers like my sister, Tessa Hager. What? Okay. Um, <laughs> help, helping me with it. And so I feel confident in her. Okay. And, and, and just curious, we the people under this you know, umbrella, the MMA version, I, I'd imagine it doesn't mean the same thing as it did in your, your WWE life, right? What does it mean, right, in the, the 2019 Jake Hager, we the people? What does that mean? Well, I mean, in this world, I feel like we all need to be nicer to each other. So I feel like we need to come together and, you know, admit that we're all here for the same reason, to live. And so I feel like let's come together. I feel like that's just like let's the people come together. Let's stop fighting each other. Yes. But let's fight, let's fight in the octagon. I love it. I love it. And by the way, Bellator is not an octagon. I just want you, it's a circle, right? So you, you have to be careful. When we talk about intellectual property, you have to be careful with that one. We don't want to piss off Scott Coker. Uh, see, I'm a rookie. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a rookie. It's okay. You're green, Dang as it. they say in the business. You're green. Uh, you, you took, I'll stick with you, all right? You took a very big step on Saturday. Uh, very happy for you. You did it. Uh, very cool. Uh, you know, you, you, you came on my show to announce the news many moons ago, over a year ago. Then you actually went through with it. Not only did you go through with it, you submitted the guy in two minutes and nine seconds. Well done, my man. I'm looking forward to seeing where you go from here, uh, how you grow and your next steps and all that. So we'll see you again in around three months or so. Uh, for now, enjoy the victory. Congratulations. And thanks for coming on this afternoon. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun, as always. All right. We'll talk to you soon. There he is, Jake Hager, one of the newest faces in Bellator. Bellator heavyweight. He wins his debut on Saturday night. Okay, let's move along now and say hello to our next guest. Speaking of heavyweights, he is currently a UFC heavyweight, but we have a lot of questions about his future. Let us not waste any more time and say hello to the former UFC heavyweight champion, the man who first defeated Fedor many moons ago, one Fabricio Verdum, Vike Cavallo himself. Fabricio, how are you? Everything's great, man. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you for doing this. It's good to talk to you. It's been a while. Okay, Fabricio, we have a lot to talk about. But first, we have to talk about the most important thing. Uh, last week, um, I, I got word it was Tuesday morning that you were the best Samaritan of all. You saved someone's life. Can you tell me the story here? What exactly happened at the beach? And when did it happen? Yes, the last Sunday, man. The last... Uh, yes. The la no, the last two Sunday. yes. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, and... Uh, it's a crazy moment, man. In my life, for sure, everything's changed my mind because I just uh, have take my family to see the uh, when I go out the water. Yeah. And uh, have a two guys in the water, like a kids, you know, 16 year old. old. And uh, when I saw the lifeguard, I just ha I just saw one guy life uh, lifeguard. When I saw just one, I say to my wife, I have to help, you know, and I just go and like a one second. Decision very quick decision. I go and I take the board. You see my hand there. Yeah, you see this. Yeah. yeah, I take this in the, his car He take the board and there is very far area very far, but I'm very scared too man. when I go to the fight I'm not scared, but this moment is I'm very scared. Wow and Yes, I'm very scared, but I go because there's one life, you know, and I saw this and uh, when I look there the, the girl say help help please help but very uh, like a scream, the ice very, you know. And uh, I just say to the guy, the lifeguard, hey man, you take the boy, the, the, the girl, I take the boy. And I go, I take him, and uh, he very tired, exhausted, man. He drink a lot of water. He tired, man. I take him, I just uh, start to walk. I I'm swim a little bit, I swim, and I just start the, 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 the walk. And uh, I take him. I put him in the, in the car, and everything is great after then. But, I mean, it's very uh, it's extreme moment, you know. The, the decision is very hard decision because imagine your family, your daughters. My wife very nervous. My daughters started crying. Oh. And, uh, I mean, it's very hard decision, but uh, I'm happy after that. I'm very, I'm feeling very uh, good. Yeah, that. that's unbelievable. Yes. Uh, amazing what you did. Parabéns for what you did um, for those thank kids. Thank you, thank you. H thank how you. old were they? Teenagers? Yes, yeah, like a 16, okay. you know, both. 16. Wow. I saw, I, I saw the guys before. Yeah. But I know, I know, I just saw the lifeguard coming his car. He started the uh, siren. What? 
yeah. very I say what what happened here man I know I I don't I don't see nothing when I saw he stopped in front of mine he stopped in the front of mine and uh I say okay because you know the guys know the guys professional but I just have one guy yeah. just one a lifeguard yeah, and I saw two keys in the water this is why I go boom inside the water you wow know? and, how and f- it's very it's very cold man this is this day it's very cold yeah but I don't feel in the water nothing cold zero and my adrenaline is very high you know incredible yes, yes. and how far did yes, you have man. to swim to get them man I think like a uh, 50 meter, meters you know Whoa. 50 meters it's very uh, it's very far very far and yes. and uh, are you a good swimmer I'm not like a professional but I'm good <laughs> <laughs> and why were they out so far away? What were they doing? I uh, know. I think the guy's very. Uh, uh, it's not too far away, and just the water pushed the guys. Oh, you know, boom. okay, okay. Yes, because very. Uh, it's, you see the, the waves there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Behind the waves, very there. Uh, very far, me. Very far. Yes. Wow, and that's you it's holding crazy. the red thing, right? Like Baywatch. Yes, I, I hate. Uh, yes, I like. Uh, you know, I, I, I just take this because I, I. I just in my mind, my I believe I have something. When I saw the lifeguard hit the board, I look his car. I saw this thing, you know. I don't know how call this thing, but I just take this. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, and I put it in my chest, and I put my chest, and I go, you know. That's yes. unbelievable. Um, and 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 so when you took them out of the water, were they okay, or did they have to go to the hospital? Yeah, the after then the guys go to the hospital. Yes, for sure, man. He, uh, the the guy, the the kid. Yeah. Drink a lot of water, you know. Okay. The, I don't. I think the the grown don't drink a lot of water. Okay. But him, yes, he he drink a lot of water. Yes. Does he know to swim, or did he know to swim? Yes, man. The guys know, but the waters uh, push the guys for the water far away. You know. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. And and and, yes, so, and you saved someone's life. How do you, how does that feel? Yes, man. After then, I receive a lot of a lot of messages in my Instagram, but uh, like uh, five thousand, maybe more. I mean, a lot of guys say congratulations, Verdun. You know, I just did because my heart said. You know, my heart say go, I go, man. My wife just say she wanna I help, but she's scared. You know, because mm. the the ocean is very dangerous, man. You know. Yeah. Mm. I would imagine one of the toughest parts is coming back with 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 the kid, right? Because it's you're 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 carrying someone with you, and the the ocean, as you said, is very powerful. Was that difficult? Yes, very difficult. But I got it. I mean, I swim, and I got it. Uh, the the lifeguard I have on the board. I have a, this thing. I'm gonna save it. But you know, I'm I'm scared, man. I I'm, I'm scared. I, when I go, I told you. When I go to the fight, no problem. But these situations, I'm very scared. <laughs> Incredible. Did you hear from the kid afterwards? Do you know how he's doing? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I just go because very front of my home. It's very it's very close to my home here. I just go the other day and I ask him, and everything's okay, man. Yeah. Oh wow! You saw the same kid? No, I don't see him, but I see the other guys. You know, the, the lifeguards. Okay. I just go to visit the lifeguards and yeah. say, hey, the kids is okay. He say, okay, everything's good. I hope one day I, t- I think it, uh, I saw the kids one day you know, because he living close here too. You know? Okay, wow. I think one day I want to see him and uh, his family, you know, and that's it. I, I, I hope so. One Incredible, day. yeah, unbelievable. Well, again, uh, well done to you. That's an amazing story and uh, one that you and your family should be very proud of. Um, also want to talk to you about your future. Where are we at right now? Because I know your manager... Uh, Ali Abdelaziz has said that you would like to be released from the UFC because you have this issue with USADA. What, I want to talk to you about this. Where does your future stand with the UFC? Yes, man. You know, I have a two more fights in UFC. But, you know, I have a, the, the bullshit thing. I like a, this, uh, the USADA, you know. Uh, the guys know, man. Hey, I don't have a problem with USADA, other uh, situation. I now have a, not in my life about nothing, like a doping. Zero, never. I have a 26 uh, test with Uzada. Just with Uzada, 26. I never have a nothing. You know, the guy tests me every time. And the one time I have a nothing. It's very uh, little thing in my body. And he, guys know that Uzada no is a contamination, you know. But the guy say no, and the guys give me two years. It's mm-hmm. like a bad, a bad decision, you know. I think so, you know. Right. And it's very a very hard situation because I don't want to stop the fight. Man. I'm very young yet. I'm 41, but my mind is like at 28. You know, I'm yeah. very young. My body is okay yet. You know, uh, and uh, yes, man, 
I, I love UFC. I work in UFC yet. I work in TV. But the best decision for me is a release for sure. You know, I want to release because I want to keep going. I want to fight more. I just, I, I love, this is my life. I, I love to fight, you know. And why have to stop just because you, you Zada said you stop and that's it, you know. Mm. It is not good, man, because the guys know it's like a contamination thing. This is nothing. I have a, you know, I don't, why I take something, I never take nothing in my life. Why? You know, I have, I ask it to the guys. And uh, the guys test me a positive one time. Two, we, two uh, weeks later, the guys test me again. It's nothing. Hmm. Why, why, I don't understand this, you know. What, how is it you have a scent in your body, you know, and uh, two weeks later, you don't have a nothing more. I don't understand. Is 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 like a contamination, man. I I'm, I spend a lot of money too. I test a lot of things for the uh, protein, a lot of things for the try found this uh, thing, you know. But I never found. And the guys say we're doing two years for you. And uh, uh, the the Uzada don't give the the same um, uh, how called the uh, for the uh, different guys, you know, different situation and the. The rules, sorry, the rules. What the rules is not the same rule for everybody. I don't stand this. Right. You know, the, each uh, different guys, fighters, is a different situation. What happened? Did the rules change? Why, why the, the rules change all the time, you know? Why? Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, this is very bad, man. This, for, for me, the best decision, for sure. I love UFC. I say thank for all, many years I had in UFC, man. I fight in the best events in the world, in Pride, in uh, Strike Force, UFC, a lot of different. But man, UFC they carry me all the time, and uh, I want to say that Uzad is one thing, and the UFC other thing. You know, it's different organization. But I want to say to UFC, please just release my contract, and I keep going. I go to fight in different uh, uh, country. I don't fight more in, UFC, uh, in USA. I don't know, but just uh, I want to. I want to I have a more thing. I want to show more things, you know. Uh, for sure, I have a more. Okay. I, I think I have a two, maybe three or more years, you know, for fight. Okay, so there's a lot I want to ask you about what you just said. Um, most importantly, do you know where the contamination came from? Like, were you able to find the supplement or what? Like, do you have any idea? I tried the found. I, I test a lot of things. I told you, I, I spent a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, try, but I never found the where. Wow. I believe, I believe is the, the, the meat. I, I eat a lot of meat, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I Google the meat from uh, one market. I don't want to say the market, but, uh, and I have a contamination, the trebolona, the same thing I have in my body, but I say to Zada and the guy's, don't care about this, you know. You guys don't wanna test the, the meat, you know. I don't know, man. It's it's, uh, it's so hard situation for me, cause just look my background. I now have a zero uh, uh, notification about the the the, the thing like, uh, in my body. Never in my life. I fight for 21 years, and I have a never. I have a problem, man. The guys don't care about this, you know. Why, you know? And a very little thing, like a contamination, you know. Mm. And the, I, I think like a very high thing. Uh, I have a no, notification before. Okay, I have to pay this. Okay, I have to pay two years. Okay, because I'm the man. I, I did. Okay, but I don't did nothing. Why I have to pay something? Yeah, I don't did. Why? I don't understand this. You know, just because those others say you know fight and that's it. You know. So when so you hard situation, yeah. yeah, I can imagine. So when you see like John Jones's situation and he gets a year yes, and man. then he gets, I, I mean, this must really frustrate you, right? Because uh, I'm I'm imagining that what you were saying just moments ago was that essentially they are favoring other fighters, right? They're they're picking and choosing how they're going, as opposed to just having a clear cut black and white. Everyone who does this one time gets X amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. You think that they're actually playing favorites? Yeah, that yeah. This I told you before. I why the the rules change all the time. The rules yeah. for somebody's uh, one rules for Verdun is one rules for other guys is different rules. Why? You know, is a, the rules the same rules for everybody? I'm okay, okay. But you know, I don't stand this uh, arrow. Why I have to pay something? I don't did man. Yeah. I don't did nothing. This is just look me and uh, you look my body and I have a problem never in my life. And the guys don't care about this, 
why, you know? I have a meeting with Luzada, five hours. I go to Denver. I have a, a meeting close to the airport, you know? Five hours the meeting with the guys. I say just the true things. The guys asking a lot of things to my life. Uh, everything. I say everything to the guys. And after the kind of guys, if it's two years. No, wow. no, two years for you. Why? You know, I think my wife, man, I don't know if you saw that, but all, all the time, you know, I'm a very joking guy. All the time, I'm joke, joke all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When there was that, I go to the, uh, the uh, Kings to test me. I say like a joke, you know, all the time I said, hey guys, I film, I post my Instagram, I film, I say, hey guys, who's that in the house? And everybody, woo, boo, you know, <laughs> and I miss my a lot. And then my wife say, hey, be careful, one day have, you have a problem with this. I say, no, this is a joke, no problem, I say to my wife. And that today, I, I give two reasons to her, because I believe this, Wow. Uh, Happening for the guys give me two years. Wow. You know, I believe that. Yes, I believe. Yes. Okay. I'm so a joke, but the guys don't care about it. Right. Joke, of course. Um, have you or your management sat down with UFC and said, please release us? And if so, what are they saying? Why aren't they releasing you? Yeah, because the, I'm the former champion. The guys love me. You know, uh, but I don't know, man. It's, it's too much, man. Two years. I'm at 41 now. I'm okay. I, I told my body's okay. My mind is good. But two years, you know, it's too much, you know. And uh, I sit with the UFC, and the guys don't want to release. But I just say, please, I want to take care of my family. You know, I have a good life for sure. But I want to keep going to fight, man. I, I, I just want to release. I have a good history with uh, UFC. Long time. I did a lot of things. I'm mean, two times uh, UFC champion. I got in the belt of versus Mark Hunt versus Kim Velasquez. You know, I help UFC for a lot of things, man. I just say, please, and I just go my way, you know, yeah. for Japan, the Russian, different place. I fight maybe two more years, and that's it. You know, I'm finished, you know. But I want to I wanna, I wanna stop the fight when I say, I'm okay. I'm okay, I'm finished. Not somebody say, you stop the fight, that's it, you know. I don't like this. And do you think that they're going to actually... Uh, oblige? Are they going to actually release you? Or are they going to keep you? Because, you know, they did to Tom Lawler. Two years he was gone. He was suspended. And then right at the end of his suspension, then they released him. That doesn't help you. That's not what you want. So do you think yes, that I, I, I believe the UFC don't did it with me because the guys love me too. I love UFC. But, yeah, man, it's so hard situation. But I believe the next time when I go to UFC, I believe UFC, very nice company. The guys say, we're doing okay. You did a very good thing with us. You work in TV, blah, blah, blah. And uh, please, okay, that's it. The list okay. with you and uh, go, give you our, our, our way. And uh, that's it, man. And when, when you know, are you I meeting with I just say good them? things to FC. When are you meeting with I them? Think, I think next week, oh. I just talk with Ali Force. You know, I want to talk with Ali again. And I want to go again there. I want to try again, you know. I don't want to wait him. Because the, the time has passed for one, two months, three months, one year. And, uh, you know. It's so hard. It's so hard situation. Man. It must be yes. frustrating because you're healthy right now. You want to fight, right? You can't. Yes, make money. I'm very healthy for sure. I just run in the beach now, man. I'm going to the beach now. I running. I have a fight coming up. You know, I have a fight versus Gordon Ryan. You know Gordon Ryan? Yes, a combat jujitsu, ju yes. right? Yes, combat jujitsu is a new thing. I mean, I, I love the the idea. The Eddie Bravo and uh, Victor Davila. You know, this is very good, like a uh, grappling and uh, with his lap, you know, his lap, like, uh, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, uh, how called uh, in, in English, like a uh, beach slap, you know. That's right. <laughs> and Gordon Ryan's great. I mean, he's he's a star in that world. The king. Yes, for sure. He's great, man. Uh, he's, he proved uh, he's the best in the world now. He just got the the world championship, you know. He right. got the division and the open division. And he, for sure, he's a great fighter. You know, but when I put this lap too, is I think everything's changed, man. Everything is changed when you put the, you uh, like a, it's not like a punch, but it's the same thing. You That's know? right. Just, yeah, uh, it's too hard, man. I think he never felt that, man. I want to show him. You know, I want to show to him. <laughs> and that's in like, February, uh, right? Yes, uh, February twenty uh, second. Yes, here in Los Angeles. Okay. Um. By the way, before I let you go, I saw a video on your Instagram. You were with Mike Tyson. And he punched yes. you. What, what happened there? What's going on with you and Mike Tyson? 
Yes, man. Hey, hey, Mike Tyson is a very nice guy, man. You know, uh, I know Rob, the company guy, the, you know, uh, he has a, the Tyson. He, he this there. I say, hey, what's up, Mike? And uh, boom, boom, he punched my face. <laughs> and hey, man, what what happened? He, he said, there's no, no uh, ride with Mike here. I have a, a guy working here. Be careful, but he's like a joke. You know, it's yes. my idea. This is my idea. I just post my Instagram and a lot of views and the guys love. And uh, Rob, I told that I ha he has a Tyson Ranch, you know, the weed company. Oh, that's your T-shirt. Yeah, You're wearing a Tyson Ranch right there. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Here, here, yeah, yes. The the weed the company, yes. He, oh. he sponsored me too, man. Uh, he was I was a corporate jail. Uh, Rob Hickman is a very nice guy. I did a lot of things with him. Uh, movies, uh, sponsor, a, a lot of things, man. He has uh, the the offices in El Segundo. It's very close to my home. Okay. You know. And uh, Mike Tice is a very nice guy, man. He is um, amazing. He's a legend. Everybody want to take a picture with him. Of everybody, uh, you know, but I, he's like my good friend too, man. Wow. I have a good relationship with him, yes. I didn't know I didn't know yes. he had a Tyson ranch. So he grows uh, cannabis? Hey, man. He's like a, yes, a weed company, you yeah, know, yeah, CBD, yeah. a lot of things. Like yeah. got good benefits. And, uh, hey, man, the company is very, go very high, man, very high level, man. It's like a, a lot of money, too, and uh, I think it's a good company, man, yes. Okay, so the plan is hopefully next week, next two weeks, you go back to Las Vegas, you sit down with the UFC, you ask them respectfully, can you release me so I can go out and continue my career, and then, and then you hope that they do that, and then shortly thereafter you want to sign with someone and get back to work, right? You want to fight ASAP. Yeah. Yes, you're good, man. You want to go with me, please? Yeah, that's <laughs> yes, I told Ali I could do a lot better work than him. You know, you step aside, Ali. Let the big boys do the business, all right? And you know what? Dana White loves me, so he'd sit down and he'd listen to me. No problem. Yes, yes, yes. yes. yes Amen. Yes, yes. For sure, this idea, you know, I believe the UFC got in and uh, look at everything I did to UFC. You know, UFC did a lot of things to me, too, man. The guys, get, they kept me all, all many years. You know, I'm the former champion two times, and uh, I believe the guy released and just let's see if they're doing okay, man. Sign here, release, and uh, keep your uh, work away, you know, and that's it, man. And just I want to give my life. I have a daughter, so I have a two daughters with me, my wife, and I want to give the good uh, life I give to my daughters, you know. I keep going in this, you know. This is very important for me. I believe the UFC look at everything and uh, release it to me. In the meantime, you're saving people people's lives, so it's not bad. Yeah, now I, I got it. Uh, Superman. I start, I, <laughs> Superman. <laughs> <laughs> after I stop the fight, I know I'm my next uh, goal, like a uh, lifeguard, you know? <laughs> I like it. Baywatch with Fabrizio I just want to say uh, thank for all the cops, the lifeguard, the... the the everybody the guys did I mean the guys did every day guys uh, save life yeah. this is amazing man this is uh, I just did one day like, uh, and uh, I feeling very well imagine the guys did every day man yeah. this is a very nice job I say congratulations for all the guys man congratulations to you as well Fabricio great to catch up with you great to see you again thank you for coming on and good luck with the UFC I hope that uh, you get what you're looking for I oh, appreciate it for you again, man. I know you many years, too, and uh, I love you. When I saw you have a, your show, everything is okay. It's very famous. You're very famous now. I'm mean, not famous, what? but you're very famous. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> My guy, Fabricio. Thank you, Fabricio. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye, man. Thank you. All right. There he is. Vai Cavallo himself, Fabricio Verdum, out there saving lives. Uh, mm -mm. What? What happened? Okay. All right. I didn't know. Um, no one told me that. Uh, that was uh, Vai Cavallo, Fabrizio Verdum, who's just out there saving lives, doing his thing, out in the beach. Incredible. And hoping to get his release from the UFC and hoping... Uh, that he gets it sooner rather than later. An unfortunate situation, a situation that we have seen with other fighters before uh, where they get suspended and it's a long suspension, two years, and they want to move on. Tom Lawler looked for the same thing and unfortunately for uh, Tom, he did get suspended, but the problem was he got suspended at the end of the two years and that's what kind of annoyed him. 
in this case, the suspension isn't a year old. It's probably, I think if memory serves me correct, it, it started in May. So, you know, his last fight was in March against uh, Alexander Volkov. Lost that fight in London, uh, looking to get back on track. Uh, he is, of course, the former heavyweight champion of the UFC and probably has at least a solid couple of years left. I mean, of course, I'm sure Bellator would like to use him, although they, they probably wouldn't use him if he was still under suspension, but uh, he does have a lot of relationships overseas, and I have a feeling that it wouldn't be too hard for Fabrizio Verdum to find some work. All right. Uh, in a matter of moments, I thought we were going to be joined by uh, Justin Gaethje, but now I'm being told that we might not be joined by Justin KG. so stay tuned for more. Let me remind you that... Uh, the Helwani Show is on television these days, my friends. And this week, you can watch our show 1 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 p.m. Pacific, technically early Wednesday, uh, late Tuesday. Um, and that will be on ESPN2. And I know a lot of you who are watching this show would say, why would I want a condensed version? Why would I want to watch this? Well, we are giving you reasons. There's going to be new segments, different things. Uh, for example, one thing that I'll be doing each and every week on the TV show is my three stars of the week. So I'm a big hockey fan and uh, a staple of the world of hockey is at the end of every game, they give out three stars awards. They say, oh, the, le troisième, le troisième étoile, the third star is uh, Patrick Marlowe, le deuxième étoile, the second star. This is how it was at the Montreal Forum when I grew up. So I'm going to be giving out my three stars of the week every week. That's going to be on the TV show. So if you're interested in that, we'll also have some new segments here and there. So watch the show. Late night, 1 a.m., 12. It's it's usually midnight. I don't know why it's on at uh, at 1 a.m. this week, but this week it's 1 a.m. Eastern on ESPN2, 10 p.m. Pacific, late Tuesday, early Wednesday. I am very excited about that. It always uh, it, it's still very surreal for me to to watch that. Um, I mean, it's it's the show on TV. It's just a very surreal thing. Uh, tomorrow in Nevada, speaking of these these commission issues, if you will. Uh, tomorrow's a very big day in Nevada, uh, January 29th. We will hopefully find out the fate of one Conor McGregor and Khabib Nurmagomedov. We may also find out the fate of all of their buddies that were involved in that melee in uh, Las Vegas back at UFC 229. So they're going to have the Nevada Athletic Commission hearing. And uh, we suspect that they will find out how long they will be punished for. Now, you must remember, whenever you find out about this, and I'm told right now it's going to be in the four to six month range, uh, you must remember that uh, it's all retroactive to the date. So uh, if they come out with a six month suspension, they'll be good to go in early April. It's not gonna be six months from now. What I'm hearing as of right now is four to six month range for both of them, but there is a chance that those who got involved post-fight in the melee, those that were involved either in the cage or outside of the cage might actually get longer suspensions. And if that does prove to be true, that could be an issue as far as Khabib Nurmagomedov is concerned, because I do believe that he is being serious when he says he is not going to fight in Nevada if he feels like um, either his friends or himself are being treated misfairly, um, being, being treated unfairly. Uh, mistreated, I should say. And, and and I do believe that he is being honest when he says, I'm not going to fight until they come back, period. And so what if they do get a, a year-long suspension? He only gets a six-month suspension. He may sit out, which could be a problem for the UFC because they obviously want him back. So that's going to be on the docket. Also on the docket is uh, John Jones. And the general consensus seems to be that he is not going to get a very long or he's not going to have any problems um, and that he'll be able to fight on, on, on March 2nd. Dana White coming out and talking about that fight against Anthony Smith to TMZ, uh, I think kind of, you know, tipped everyone's hand that, okay, that they are going to go ahead with this. And more importantly, that they don't suspect that Nevada will have an issue with this. You'll recall he was supposed to fight at the end of the, the, the year in Nevada. Nevada said they needed more time. They needed to have their hearing in January to see what was going on with the, the, the picograms and was it really from the old test and uh, do they feel comfortable relicensing him because he didn't have a license to fight in Nevada yet. He only had a license to fight in uh, the state of California. And so 
uh, they needed to have this hearing, and they are going to have the hearing, but the fact that the fight is technically on the books, it's not officially announced just yet, uh, seems to be a sign that everyone is confident that it's going to be okay. And in fact, they are going to have a press conference on Thursday. They've announced that there's going to be a press conference on Thursday, but they haven't announced who's going to be at said press conference, which is very interesting. Um, and that's because they don't want to let the cat out of the bag. So that's going to be on the docket tomorrow in Nevada. Uh, so it's, it's, it's going to be must-see TV. I'm curious to see how Nevada handles the John Jones situation. I'm also curious to see what they do with Connor and Khabib. And last week it came out that in a VADA test, so now John has to work with the voluntary anti-doping agency who doesn't actually punish. They just uh, administer the test. A lot of people consider them to be the most kosher, the most up and up um, testing organization out there that the picograms did show up. And it's amazing to me that it wasn't really all that big of a story. And so you're either in the camp that, yeah, okay, this is just going to be there forever. You believe in this pulsing effect, if you will, uh, which there isn't a lot of data on. Um, or you're in the camp that, wait, something kind of weird is going on here that we've never seen before because we've seen in other sports where things happen. Um, you know, someone gets, gets popped and the, 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 the substance, whatever it may be, as small as it may be, is still in the system for an extended period of time and it just doesn't go away and they can't compete until it actually goes away, even if that means several years. In the case of John Jones, that's not what is happening. And I'm curious with that news coming out, uh, mid last week uh, via MMA fighting. What is Nevada going to say about that? Do they even care? Are they buying into what the California State Athletic Commission and the United States Anti-Doping Agency have said, which is essentially, this is an old, uh, this is an old infraction. You can't be tried twice for the same infraction. So as long as it's the same long-term metabolite in his system, we are not going to punish him again. I know that there are people out there uh, like Daniel Cormier who do not believe uh, in that story, but that appears to be the world that we are living in. So that's tomorrow in Nevada. Um, and also, I want to remind you that Saturday, the UFC is returning on ESPN+. Plus. They're returning to Fortaleza, Brazil. This is uh, the card. So they were off this past week, but this is the beginning of a pretty busy stretch for the UFC. We spoke to Marlon Moraes last week um, on the program. He meets Hafal Sunsau. I still believe that uh, the winner of this fight should be the number one contender at 135 pounds, but uh, I, I am definitely getting word that the, the, the future of the flyweight division does not look very good. And if it doesn't look very good, uh, it appears as though... Um, Henry Cejudo's future could very well be at 135 pounds. And then if it's at 135 pounds, how do you not give him a title shot? If you're going to take away his division, if you're going to take away his belt, and he just beat the champion in that weight class, how do you not give him a title shot right off the bat? I don't know. So let's, I know last week he did meet with the UFC, um, and it's been hard to get in touch with him. I think he's in Brazil right now. Um, so perhaps he's going to be doing media surrounding this event. It's been hard to get an update on how that meeting went. Something tells me the fact that I haven't been able to get that update. It didn't go maybe as planned. Um, but that's the state of the flyweight division. And it's essentially that there is no real answer on the state of the flyweight division. He wants to fight TJ at 135 pounds. TJ, as he told us last week, wants to fight him, again, at this point, doesn't care if it's at 135 or 125. He wants to go up to make history. TJ just wants a shot at beating him and righting the wrong that happened last week in Brooklyn. So it kind of leaves the stakes for this Asun Sao Marais fight uh, somewhat up in the air. And it's a little bit weird as far as, okay, what exactly are these two men fighting for? Their resumes would suggest that they're fighting for a lot, that they should be fighting for a belt next with a victory. Uh, of course, it's a rematch of a fight that happened two years ago, but right now we still don't really know what's going on with 125, and because we don't know what's going on with 125, we don't really know what's going on with 135. Bit of a mess of a situation, but that's a great fight. Regardless of the stakes, that is a great fight. Uh, also on the card, Jose Aldo going up against Renato Moicano. And 
that is uh, an important fight at 145, and it's a fun fight because you have a uh, featherweight king, a former legend at 145 pounds, going up against a rising star at 145 pounds in Brazil. It's two Brazilians. It's very rare that this sort of thing happens, where it's Moicano who's on the, the up and up, and Aldo, who looked very good in his last fight against Jeremy Stevens, but of course the uh, former champion, meeting each other in Brazil. That's fun. That's fun stuff. Lyman Good uh, on the card against Damian Maia. You've got the return of Johnny Walker. It's a nice little card. It all goes down on ESPN+. Uh, I don't have the times here in front of me uh, because I went a little long when talking about that uh, that main event. But I do believe it's an earlier start time here's the times do, 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 do. yeah espn plus uh the prelims start at 5 p.m eastern this entire card by the way is on espn plus and the main card starts at 8 p.m eastern how great is that remember last week i told you the times they are changing as far as the the start times and the end times are concerned i know a lot of you are very excited about that i'm probably most excited by the way, back to uh, Connor for a second as I was getting into his future. Uh, last week, I was talking about Donald Cerrone and I was talking about on the bad guy show, Ariel on the bad guy show, and I said that I didn't really love the way he's going about trying to get this fight, that he's, uh, you know, I just, I just felt that it was a little bit weak. I felt like it was, you know, he was paying too much respect to Connor. He was coming out and saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just living in Connor's world and it would be an honor to fight him and hey, let's go have a Budweiser. It just, I, I didn't understand how we got to this point when three years ago we were at a press conference um, in Las Vegas and he was talking about how Connor couldn't hang at 155 and he'd never beaten anyone of note before and now all of a sudden it's all chummy chummy. Now of course I know that Connor is a lot more popular and a lot, um, you know, he, he's accomplished a lot more in his in his life and in his career since then, but it just seemed a little funny to me. Uh, I think I, I upset a lot of people with those comments, but it's interesting to see that and, and, and to see his approach, Cerrone's approach, and to see the reaction to all of that. And then a couple of days later, here comes Max Holloway uh, going on tours of uh, the Jameson Distillery, I think it is, with the subtle jab at proper 12 saying that it, it's not a watered-down trend. Um, and, then, and then going on a tour of Croke Park. I mean, this is great stuff. This is very fun. This is, look, I'm not saying come out there and just like manufacture hate, but let's be a little creative here. I don't think anyone wants to see a, uh, a glorified sparring match. There he is. Look at that smile. Look at Max hanging out with the guys. This is amazing. Max saw my, uh, my, my, my comments on Donald and said, watch what I do in the next couple of days. And I was like, okay. I'm sure he's going to have a tweet, some sort of Instagram post. I didn't think he'd actually go to Dublin and, and, and go to Jameson and then go to Croke Park. Subtle jabs. Didn't come out. You know, it, it, it wasn't very forward. I like that. It made you think a little bit. All of a sudden, Max Holloway's in, in Dublin on a Saturday. What's he doing there? Everyone got very upset when I tweeted, oh, Max Holloway's in Dublin. Who cares? I'm in London right now. I'm in Texas. I'm in Chicago. I'm in Brooklyn. Yeah, there's a point. There's a method to the madness. Just when you think that you have all the answers, we change the questions. We being, you know, Max and I in this case. That was good stuff. Don't tell me you would want to see that fight. I want to see the Cerrone fight too. I said I wanted to see it last week. And, and as of last week, what I was hearing was that Cerrone was atop the leaderboard. I don't know if this changes things. Um, yeah, sure. You know, Connor gets to decide which direction. For the most part, he has earned that. Um, and I think that Cerrone is a good style matchup for him to try to get back on track. It's a fighter who's going to stand toe to toe with him. Uh, a little bit older right now. Yes, I know he looked good in his last fight. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a good matchup. It's not a wrestler. It's someone who is going to, I think, present a favorable style, a favorable matchup um, right now for Connor to try to get back on track, right? But the Holloway fight to me is, you know, there's a great backstory there. You've got Holloway who uh, his last loss was against Connor in 2013. And then he has not lost since, and he's gone on to win, you know, 13 or so fights in a row. He's the featherweight champion. He's the reigning defending featherweight champion. He beat 
he beat Max Holloway. Excuse me, he beat Jose Aldo twice. I mean, there's a great backstory. Now he's actually going to Dublin, which is something that I've said in the past that others should do. Actually go to Dublin and try to poke the bear, try to get that fight. I loved it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Again, I have no problem with the Stroni fight. I, I, I think some people, just because we put out, you know, the clip of, of, of you know, the one minute or so clip of me talking about that, didn't really understand that I'm giving Stroni props here. Listen, you're the winningest fighter in UFC history. You just had a big win on ESPN. You headline one of the most watched prelims of the last 10 years. Yes, I know that Connor has a lot of power. I know he has a lot of influence. But this whole approach that like, hey, you know, I'm just living in Connor's world. Oh, yeah, you know, like, I, I just want the opportunity. I just want the lottery ticket. I just think that's a tough, that's a tough, you know, narrative to get behind. In fighting, what do we like? We like we like there to be some conflict and we want to see it get resolved. I don't think we want, you know, we, we want buddies coming together. Glory. Hey, let's have a toast afterwards. Eh, it's kind of, I'm not saying we have to go all the way into the Habib territory. It has to be as toxic as that, as personal as that, as dark as that. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying to fabricate anything. But we heard you three years ago talking about Connor. What, what has changed? Is it just because you're a father now and you want money? Okay, fine. More power to you. But I'm allowed to weigh in on that. I'm allowed to tell you that I feel like it, 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 it's hard to get up for that. It's hard to get excited about that. It just was a big shift from where we were just a couple of years ago. And, you know, I know, I know Cerrone's not the kind of guy to talk a lot of smack. I know he's not the kind of guy, you know, to, you know, even with Alex Hernandez last week, he said, I'm not that guy. And I think that's why a lot of people, one of the reasons why a lot of people like Donald Cerrone, I, I do believe, I, I don't just think, I do believe that that is one of the main reasons why people like Cerrone. He, he, he doesn't really talk the talk in the sense that he doesn't need to talk the talk. He's not one to try to play mind games and talk trash and whatnot. But he certainly walks the walk. He always comes. There's never been a boring Donald Cerrone fight. The fights that he's won, the fights that he's lost. There's never been a boring one. And he's the perfect foil for Conor as far as opponents go, as far as styles go. 100%. No doubt about that. But it, it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way to hear him be like, so, aw, shucks. I'd love, you know, I just, I'd love the opportunity to test myself against him. When you have all these people gunning for him, when you have all these people calling him out, when he hasn't won in two and a half years, you know, I just want, I, you know, it's just, I'm just living in Connor's world. I just, I'd love that shot. I don't know. Kind of, I kind of felt like it was weird. And again, as I try to reiterate afterwards, it's not because I don't think he's good or respect him or like watching him fight. I think it's amazing what he's done, especially as of late. It just caught me by surprise. Okay. Um, Wait a second. Corporate Jake tell me we got Justin, but it's Holly's time now. All right. Uh, in a matter of moments, I think we're going to be joined by someone. Who that is? I don't know. Still to come, we've got Darren Till. We've got Henry Corrales with the big win over Aaron Pico. Uh, who else? Demetrius Johnson. Who I'm very curious. What he had to say about last Saturday in uh, Brooklyn. We also have Jorge Masvidal coming up in a matter of moments as well. Uh, but I do believe up next we're going to be joined by Justin Gaethje, who meets Edson Barbosa on March 30th in Philadelphia. That's a very important fight at 155 pounds. Interesting times at 155 pounds. I was just telling you about Habib and Cerrone and Max Holloway and Conor McGregor. I know Gaethje was frustrated with the way things were going. So let us talk to Justin Gaethje, who I do believe is standing by right now on the phone. Justin, how are you? I'm good. What's up, Ariel? It's, it's good to talk to you. I thought that you forgot about me. I was a little bit sad there for a second. Hey, you're Mr. Big Time now. You gotta, we have to wait till we get the call from you to be, be on here. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, I'm just living in your world, Justin, sort of like Cerrone living in Connor's world. Uh, I'm just living in yours. It's great to talk to you, though. L let me get into it. I know you were frustrated. You wanted Iaquinta. You wanted a big fight. You felt like you weren't being treated the right way with the proper respect. Is Edson Barbosa in Philadelphia, does that feel like a big fight? Do you feel like you got what you wanted? 
Uh, hey, I'm from day one. Uh, I wanted to fight Edson. My first fight I was hoping would be Edson instead of Michael Johnson. So uh, that alone, uh, you know, is is waking me up every morning. You know, I think he's one of the scariest guys in the lightweight division, and you know, that's that's the those are the tasks that I I signed up for whenever I did this. I want to fight the best, most scariest in the world. But um, no, I, I wasn't happy with the. Uh, I wanted Kevin Lear. I wanted Ali Akinta. Um, and now Kevin's over here calling fucking Michael Johnson out. It's the craziest shit in the world to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, hey, I again, the scariest dude. I think he's the best in the world in lightweight division for one round, for the first round. So I'm gonna go out there and I have to be, uh, you know, you know, hands down. I gotta be on point. Why couldn't you get Iaquinta or Kevin Lee? What were you being told? I don't know. I wasn't being told. I mean, the guys don't want to fight me. I mean, there's no, like, it's not like that's a secret. Uh, Kevin wants to t- act like a bad dude. He'll wear a fucking uh, f- bulletproof vest around and acting like he's a fucking gangster. But, you know, he don't want to take the tough fights. He he just got his ass kicked by Allen. Now he wants to fight Michael Johnson because I'm sure he thinks that's an easier fight. Uh, I don't know. Michael Johnson's coming from 145. He said he was going to go to 170, and I want to fight a guy that's coming from 145. Yeah, a lot of this does not make sense to me, but, you know, my mindset I, I know is different than Al, and I know it's different than Kevin. And so, um, you know, I can't, I can't fathom why their mind works like this, but um, I'm going to go out there and, again, the scariest dude in the world for one, for one round, and that's who I'm fighting next. Yeah, and and I, I, I obviously you just said that you were you know very interested in fighting Edson for a long time. He's coming off a nice win. He's back on track. So this and they're giving you a main event. So do you feel like you're getting the respect from the UFC? Because and and correct me if you feel like I'm misconstruing your words, but I I, I read a story that you did. I think it was with Brad Okamoto at at ESPN.com where you said that you felt like you weren't getting that kind of respect. That you weren't getting the big opportunities. Does this feel like a big opportunity? No. I mean. I mean, at the end of the day, it sounds like a little bitch when all that comes out of my mouth. Because, I mean, I'm getting uh, this is four out of you know four out of five fights I've been main event. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there's a reason for that, and um, you know, uh, I would like to be compensated more fairly for those last two rounds. That's my only argument when it comes to fighting a main event. But that's not something that's. Uh, you know, that's only 1% of people or 0.1% of people are going to complain about something like that, which is myself because they, I keep getting these main events. You know, I'm not asking for them. Um, I love being there. I love being the last fight of the night. I love being the highlight of the night. I love, you know, being the main the main billing on a fight card in the UFC. It's, you know, I love my picture being on the poster. All those things are, are what I love. But those two rounds, especially for someone like myself, are the most dangerous rounds that there are. If I do pass away or suffer a serious injury it will probably lead or come in the fourth or fifth round and so uh, that's my only complaint when it comes to that but again i mean that's um a small complaint uh because i am getting made of it on espn the eyeballs are going to be tremendous and uh, it's going to be great but i couldn't agree more with you i i do feel but don't don't you get 25k more if you're in the main event are you saying that you want that you feel like you have yeah i'm saying that's that. not nearly enough yep. Ariel. yep i agree I couldn't I mean, agree more. Granted, granted, I sound like a spoiled little brat when no, I say twenty five thousand dollars is enough, but it's not enough, especially when I'm, you know, if, who knows what I get paid? I don't even want to say. But let's say it's a hundred and a hundred, and that's you know a hundred and a hundred for the first three rounds, and then I'm getting paid twenty five for the most crucial, most devastating to my health rounds that there are, and that's rounds four and five. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. So, have you actually made this request? And if so, what do they say when you ask this? Hey, I'm here. I need to go out and shut up. I need to go out there and whoop Edson's ass so I have, you know, more leverage. That's the name of the game. I mean, we, you know, our, uh, we fall back on ourselves. We don't necessarily have the representation that we need, so we got to represent ourselves. You got to go to fight. You got to go to war for yourself whenever, um, when principles come, come to the forefront, uh, I go to war for myself. And, um, so I'm going to go out there. I'm going to try my hardest. I'm going to be ultimately 100% prepared for Edson. And then after that, uh, you know, it's it's down to business because again, I have to fight for myself. How many fights you have left? I don't know. I'm I'm I'll sign a different contract after this fight. Oh, really? Have you been told that, or is that just the plan in your mind? No, that's just what I'm saying. Yeah, because you deserve it. I've right. been told it. Oh, okay, okay, that's good. Um, and okay, so four. Is, is, is this is different? I feel like. 
than what I've heard from you in the past. Are you starting to think more about your long-term health? Is that why the extra two rounds are kind of, you know, are, 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 are a bigger deal to you now? Do you feel like, yeah, I, you do admit that you do take, you know, a, a certain amount of damage. That's your style. You're okay with that. You sign up I'm for that. Saying, I would say, I would put it more on a broad perspective of if a fighter is going to suffer a serious injury, it will probably be more than likely come later in the fight, which, you know, after round three comes four and five, and most people aren't doing that. So it's not even a circumstance, but for me it is. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I just I need to uh, address it. Okay. Um, Barbosa is coming on that same card that I, Quinta, fought. Uh, Kevin Lee looked very good against Dan Hooker, but, of course, fought a very different opponent than he did in his previous two fights, right? You know, fighting Kevin Lee, fighting Khabib, wrestlers who, who were taking him down on the ground. Do you subscribe to the theory that, oh, Edson is a different fighter, he's better now, he's improved, or do you just feel like that was a more favorable matchup and, you know, was he was able to showcase, you know, the kind of striker that he is against someone who's younger than him? Uh, I think at the end of the day, a fight's a fight. Um, there's, no, there's no way around that, and uh, Edson is one of the best in the world. He's had... So many fights in the UFC versus some of you know, versus the top caliber guys in the world. Um, his experience alone um, can take him, you know, can can put him in fights that maybe he shouldn't be against, be in stylistically. But um, I think he, you know, he, he moved camps. I think uh, he's. I'm sure that he has a new uh, a newfound love, you know, for what he's doing. Um, probably more confident than he was after those two losses. A hell of a lot more confident than he was after those two losses. So. Um, a fight's a fight. I have to go out there. I have to fight my best fight. I have to put pressure on him. Uh, I can't give him space. He's he's so dangerous whenever he's able to spin and and plant his feet. So I have to make it a point to not uh, not let him do that. And um, you know, I am a wrestler. Maybe I'll take him down. I have no idea. But I uh, I'm gonna go out there. I, I def, you know I'm not worried about my health, but I do want to be the best in the world. And I understand that I have to fight methodical in spots to do that. You were supposed to fight I Quinta in August. Now it seems like he's not all that interested in fighting you. Does this frustrate you? You know it does. You know it does. I, uh, man, I, I honestly don't have too much bad to say about Al. At the end of the day, I, it's, such, it's, it's a business, and I understand you have to make the right decision for yourself. Uh, but he's ranked number four in the UFC, and if you want that spot, if they're going to jump him up that high, after he beats Kevin, which, you know, again, I can't argue against, then, you know, he either has to fight, he wants to fight the guys in front of him. I can't blame him. But, you know, if Connor's going to fight Donald, if Al's, you know, if uh, Khabib's not going to fight, if Tony's going to fight Dustin, then that leaves Al, you know, shit out of luck. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that he thought he was going to get that Connor fight, and now it's not looking like it. So uh, who knows? I'm sure he, he's, a, he's a liar. There's no way he makes. Uh, he makes he sell he can sell houses for a whole year and make what he makes in one fight. So, if he wants to go and work his ass off, then good for him. Uh, how do you feel about the top of your weight class? Because it does seem like there's a lot of guys who deserve big fights, who deserve to be fighting for belts, and there's just so much uncertainty. Maybe tomorrow we'll find out more when they have this hearing. But it does feel like even a guy like Dustin Poirier, a guy like Ferguson, not guaranteed a title shot. Does this all make your head hurt? Do, are you frustrated? Do you feel like there's a ceiling there that it's going to be very hard to break through? Yeah, I think so, but, you know, um, again, with this sport, it's all about how you win, and the way if I do win, it's going to be spectacular. There's no other there's no other way to it. So that, that does a lot for you, but I, you know, politics, I have a good manager, so um, I can I can take that to the bank and to know that if I deserve uh, a fight, then I'm going to get it. Yeah. Um, well, by the way, what about your coach, Trevor Whitman, on the broadcast? Did you see that last week? I did. I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, he was great. A nice addition. Is that going to be a? Has he told you? Is that like a permanent thing? I don't know anything. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's moving that way. Okay. Wow. Good for him. That's great. Well, I don't. I have no idea for sure. 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 Um, all right. Well, this. Fu- I mean, you versus Edson Barbosa. I don't know if you've seen some of the reaction to it. Uh, the fans just foaming at the mouth when this fight was announced. So uh, I'm not really uh, sure. I'm foaming at the mouth. Yes. Uh, I'm not really sure what's at stake in this fight. I don't. I don't really know if you're fighting number one contender, all this stuff. But just from like a pure action standpoint, and I hate to say this, but I feel compelled to say it. I see no way that this fight is boring. You know, it's like one of the. I, I kind of feel like we say that about all of your fights, if I'm being honest. But this one in particular. I, yeah, I'm sure you could take that to the bank. <laughs> no, for me, uh, this is big for me. Uh, 
I'm represent, you know, it's stupid and corny to say, I'm representing the United States of America. I've always wanted to fight guys from different countries, and this is the best Brazil has to offer. I will be carrying the American flag with me to the cage, and after I knock him out, I'll be, I'll be, I'll have it wrapped around my shoulders because uh, that's what I got in this for is to uh, to be the best in the world, and that's that means being the best uh, from other countries. That's not something you typically do, right? I've never fought someone from a different country. Really? I only fought, well, I guess I fought Paul Amino. Paul Amino, yeah. WS, WSLF, but uh, you've lived in America for quite a while. Right. And other than that, it was all Americans? Yeah, I guess Pretty much. So. I mean, I fought Luis Firmino. He was Brazilian, but again, I was at a different, I was fighting for different reasons at that time in my life. Okay. What are you fighting for now? Well, I mean, again, from day one, it was to be the best in the world, but you know, to be the best in the world, you have to be in the UFC. So my objective then was to not was to win convincingly and go to the UFC so that I have the chance to fight the best in the world from other countries. And Edson Barboza is the definition of that. Right. Well, I can't wait. March 30th, Philadelphia, Edson Barboza, Justin Gaethje, an incredible fight on paper. Uh, and I don't think I've ever seen a dull Justin Gaethje fight. Uh, I, I'm confident in saying this one won't be dull either. Justin, good to talk to you. I'm glad that we we tracked you down. You're welcome here anytime. Just for the record. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. It's good to know. I didn't know. Uh, I did. I thought we had to call your secretary. You had to call her secretary. What are you, you talking? Get a hold of- <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? You, are you saying I sold out, Justin? Is that what you're implying? No, no. I'm saying you got more. You got more followers than me, man. I, I, hey. Listen. I love what you do. Listen. I love what you're doing. I love how you do it. I love you and Chael together. Thank I think you. Chael's a brilliant, a brilliant mind. Uh, Listen, I love hearing you guys I just talk. had like a team of five people track you down for the last 30 minutes. We're chasing you, my man. I I know I was I was in wrestling practice, and I got a little distracted. I'll get my ass whooped to what was happening. That's all good. Well, I'm happy we spoke. Thanks for doing this, Justin. We'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Good luck America. to you. America. Yes. Later. There, there he is, Justin Gaethje. Uh, very excited to represent his country on March 30th. I'm looking forward to that. Now, a couple of weeks prior in Las Vegas, March 2nd, UFC 235. It's going to be Holly Holm against Aspen Ladd. Let us not keep her waiting any longer. Let's go to the Magic of Skype and say hello to the preacher's daughter, Holly Holm. There she is. Hello, Holly. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very sorry for keeping you waiting. Uh, you can blame Justin Gaethje <laughs> no. for that, so I apologize. Okay. Gosh darn. I'm okay. All right, Holly. Well, we I have... needed the few minutes anyway. Okay, perfect. Well, it all worked out. Um, and we don't often get you on Skype, so this is very exciting as well. Thank you for doing this. Um, okay, Thank Holly. You. So we have a lot to talk about. You versus Aspen Ladd. When you got this fight, did you even know who Aspen Ladd was? Were you aware of what she had been doing thus far in the UFC? Uh, I, had, I had seen her last fight. and I mean, I, I'm really bad, actually, as far as following a lot of um, the other fighters and everything. But I just because I get so into who I, I'm facing at the time. But, um, yes, I knew that she was coming in and kind of making, you know, making a little bit of, of noise. Um, she's undefeated, and um, I think especially with her last fight, being able to take on, you know, um, kind of a pioneer of the sport in a way and being able to finish it early. So I know that I'm up against a really tough opponent. I think that undefeated and young fighters are the um, – I think they're the biggest uh, threat to take because they feel like they have everything ahead of them. They feel like they're, you know, their destiny is in front of them. They're mentally strong. They haven't really faced like this hard, hard, like loss yet and all that. So yeah, I definitely think this is a very tough fight. I'm not taking her lightly at all. Does it get you excited? You know, she's not, she's not the biggest name. She's not a household name, but as you just mentioned, a tough fight, a tough opponent. Does it get you excited? Yeah. Um, I'm just excited to fight period. You know, I'm I'm excited that I'm still at it, still in it. And I think that one of the biggest things for me is that I was, you know, I was the kind of young up and comer trying to ruin everybody's dreams along the way. So I understand where she's coming from. Um, it's just I want her to do that. Just not with me. Yes. It's going to happen later. Does it feel like the UFC is using you in that spot these days, like the Megan Anderson fight? Maybe try to build someone off you. Aspen Ladd build someone off you. Do you feel like they're trying to? That's not going to happen. OK. No. It didn't happen the last time. Not going to happen this time. No. Okay. Absolutely not. You know, I feel like um, I know I had some losses on my uh, and my record here, but that's not. It wasn't like I was getting, you know, just like my butt handed to me in these fights. Yes, they they really irritate me and they make me mad and there are sore spots in my heart. But um, I know that I gave a hard fight for every fight that I've been in, and I just needed to make those changes to make it a definite win instead of you know 
what was close. I mean, there's a couple of fights that sell out could have gone either way. I don't like that. I I want to be able to dominate, and I know that I'm still there, and I know that I'm still capable of beating all these girls. So that's where I'm at. That's why I train hard still. Um, I still know I have a lot to learn. I have a lot to show. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, you came out of that Megan Anderson fight in June relatively healthy. Uh, why did it take you so long? So by the time we fight, it'll be you know nine months since your last fight. Why so long to get another fight? Uh, well, I, I did have a knee surgery, and I've got a lot. I had a yes. lot of stuff going on, you know, in my life. I think everybody's kind of seen a lot of that going on. So, I just kind of let myself, you know, uh, my knee surgery. And there's a lot of people. Why are you telling people, you know, you had knee surgery? No, listen, I've been training with a bad knee for a while, and um, and then it finally just actually like had an issue in training that like set it over the edge, and now it's great. Okay. Um, I've actually had you know, issues with it, um, for quite some time and I finally just got it fixed. So now it's, now it's even stronger than it was before. So it's not something I'm worried about people that know I had it. Hey, everybody, I had a knee surgery. <laughs> yes. I don't I, mind people knowing I'm, I, it's doing better now. I feel better. So, I'm an idiot. Um, I'm the one who reported the knee surgery back in September. And, and, and I asked you that oh, question. I'm an idiot. I'm sorry about that. Oh no. I, I, I we told people I had, I had knee surgery. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm not worried about people knowing. Okay. Um, no, but because I asked you, you know, why you had been out for so long. Obviously, that 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 makes sense because of the surgery. That was something that you were dealing with for multiple fights, not something that had happened in the in the Anderson fight. Well, it was something. Um, I've had it. It was basically two years an injury that I had, and it was something I was able to train with, but it just wound up kind of finally just getting worse. You know, I had a torn meniscus. Uh, for two years, actually, I, I tore it um, right before my Shevchenko fight um, in 2016. But I was able to train on it, and I'm always one of those like I'll try and rehab before I have surgery. And it was something I was able to train on it hard for, you know, and and have some battles for two years. Um, but it just got to the point where it was locking up on me, you know. Um, I think because it just got worse, and so, uh, you know, when I was training, it just kind of, it kind of had that moment where it took that extra that extra pop in there and it just wasn't something I could really train with anymore. So I got it fixed. So now it's, it's not locking up at all. And sometimes I think, man, why didn't I do that sooner? Mm, yeah, I bet. Um, you also just uh, alluded to the fact that you had some personal issues that kind of got out there in the public, uh, that, that you and your husband, um, had recently filed for divorce. Uh, how, how are you doing with all of that? And how do you feel about the world knowing about that sort of thing? Um, well, Honestly, uh, yeah, it's true. If it wasn't true, I would have gone on and said this is a bunch of BS, you know. Um, it is true, and we knew that it was probably going to hit. Um, you know, we kind of – actually, we had, we had kind of put in for it to be like a, you know, sealed case just because, you know, I'm in the public eye, and my husband has a family business locally that is also, in the you know, a local business. So um, we actually – Put for if they wanted it to be sealed and they didn't so which is fine with me i'm i'm one of those i've always been an open book i'm not trying to go through my life acting like everything's perfect and i'm not trying to go through uh pretending something's not going on when it is and yes um you know now i and and there'll maybe be a time I'll, I'll open up more about it later i'm not really sure but um there's a there's a lot of things that i've been dealing with for for quite some time for a very long time and now i'm free of it so um, there's a lot of stuff that has happened and, and, you know, I can sit here and act very, um, unfair about things, but I just trying to focus on things that I do have in my life and not things that I don't have. Um, there's been a lot of things I've, um, I've really had to face be just even to get to the point where we're at now. And then, you know, through this process and, you know, I, I'm one of those that I don't like to carry hate in my heart ill will in my heart, none of that. Um, I think that's very different than having respect. <laughs> There's, And, you know, I, I was one of those that really wanted to try and do this, what they call collaboratively. Hmm. And I think that I don't really know which, which divorce really can be that collaborative because if you can get along that well, maybe you wouldn't be getting divorced. But um, I have to say I... Um, when I got married, I didn't get married to get divorced. That definitely was not, I mean, who does that? Right. Um, and there's a lot of things that I kept trying to almost convince myself was okay along the way until it just um, was too much after a while. And I know that a lot of people 
say that all oh, this just caught us off guard. This is so, I, I can't believe this. This is just out of the middle of nowhere. And I'm thinking this is not out of the middle of nowhere. Mm. <laughs> this is definitely not out of the middle of nowhere. This is something that um, has been quite the struggle. And um, I still don't ever wish ill will on anybody because to me that's too heavy of a weight to, to carry on my shoulders. Um, it's, and then that just it prevents me from uh, moving forward with my happiness and things like that. Um, there are details um, and there's things, you know, with this divorce. I, mean, I, I haven't been at home for about a year. Um, a lot of people are just not, which I'm, I'm glad that it wasn't something that just was like blasted out right away. And I don't really like to um, be the one to get on social media and just like blast out and, and have it as a, I call it people's like, um, personal journal but they put it like for everybody else to read and I definitely don't want to be immature about any of this um however there are things sometimes I feel like need to be said um I don't know maybe there's other people that have been in my position and um but if that time feels right I will maybe I'll tell more like actual details about it but um for right now yes the, the we filed for a divorce and um, I'm, I'll say this, I'm happy and I know that I am still blessed in so many ways in my life and I have so many opportunities in front of me and that's what I'm going to stay focused on. Well, I'm happy to hear that you're happy that you're at peace with this. Um, do you feel different? Like as you're preparing, cause you just alluded to the fact that you had been dealing with, you know, a lot in your personal life as you're preparing for these fights, there's a lot of stress. I'm sure with preparing for fights, you're emotional, you're building to a fight, there's anxiety, but now you don't necessarily have to deal with all of that. Do you feel like this is, even though we're in the early stages of the camp, a different camp because of what's going on in your personal life or maybe what's not going on, I should say. Yeah, I feel like there's a different stage of everything. You know, um, my last fight with Megan, actually, I was already out of the house. So that okay. was something that I could just focus on. Right now, actually, probably a little bit more going on just because the actual filings and everything are taking place right now. Okay. Um, but I think that I've faced so many kind of things along the way. Um I just need to be able to compartmentalize and move forward. And yes, there's there's a lot of uh, focus that I can have. I, I can just come to the gym, not not have other worries outside of the gym, and just be able to focus while I'm here and not have my mind wandering. Um, I'll never make excuses and say that there, you know, this is the reason why I had losses, or this is the reason why I wasn't focused before, or this that that's not something I'll ever do. I'll never sit there and say um, any excuses. I know. Um, if it wasn't that, maybe it was something else I would be battling with in, in our personal life. We all, every single one of us that fights has a personal life as well. And who knows what's going on in it? You know, I'm going, going through a divorce and, you know, somebody else might be going through losing, you know, their mom from cancer or somebody else might be going through, you know, maybe a loved one that is a drug addict or maybe somebody, you know, um, I, there's a lot going on in people's lives. So I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, I, I've had this hard go and all that definitely been a challenge of my life and definitely been something I really learned from um things I know that I, I've, I've learned from to go forward with and um like I said there's there's been a lot a lot that's happened and uh kind of a battle with that yes um I think that things are always simpler if you don't have something else you know kind of tugging at you and pulling you down uh, I think that you can be stronger when you have you know, that other support there. So I definitely feel like things could have been easier, but I'm not going to say that it was any reason why I didn't, you know, do well on my own. I, 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 uh, my dad's always told me you're in charge and you're, uh, you're in charge of your own happiness. You're in control of your own happiness. And with that, not meaning that, you know, you can't have days that are down. Of course, life's going to like give you something that's going to make it a little harder uh, and there's going to be challenges, but I don't want to be so down and so upset about this one thing uh, that this person can still control how I feel every day. If I wake up every day and have this like cloud over my head and I stay angry about it, um, that's controlling my happiness for the day. And I don't want that. I don't want someone to be in control of that. That doesn't mean that I haven't had some, you know, some hurdles to overcome and some struggles, but 
um, I, I want to choose happiness. I want to choose, I mean, how blessed are we in this life anyway? And I'm surrounded by great people. Um, I'm, you know, I know that I've been able to get here because I've had, um, self ambition and self motivation, um, with the support of my team and my friends and my family, of course. But, um, I know that I can, it, it's not just the end here. Like I know that I still have that to go forward. Uh, life is full of blessings and God is really, really good. So I'm going to stay positive on that. And, and knowing just how popular you are in Albuquerque, this news coming out, I can't imagine what your life is like. Albuquerque's most eligible bachelor. Oh, holy smokes. You must have people coming up to you left and right. It must be overwhelming. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, you know, for me, I, I guess I don't even really think about that. I'm, I'm more just focused on, on myself and, I don't really see myself as a bachelor. I do. I do enjoy my, my peace and quiet at home. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I think locally, I mean, my, my husband has a, a family business that's very, very successful here. You know, they, they, they do quite, quite the business. I'll tell you that, um, you know, they, they are involved as well. So I think a lot of people, you know, not only know me, but know the both of us and because, um, very, I mean, they they make multi millions every year uh, with their company, and so they're very involved with Albuquerque as well. And okay, I think it's definitely something that people feel. Um, you know, if a lot of people were we know each other through someone, so there's a lot of people that are kind of tied together on this. We have a we have a lot of mutual friends, um, and my I guess my biggest thing is I don't want any of them to feel ever stuck in the middle. I don't want to lose any friends that I created through this relationship. And I don't want any of the friendships that he had to be severed either. It's not anybody else's fault that we didn't work out. Um, I want it to be as um, positive as, as possible. But I mean, with that being said, maybe I'll open up more about, you know, actual stuff, but I don't really want to lay out all the dirty laundry. So. I feel you. I, I and I appreciate you being as open um, as as you just were. So thank you for 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 talking about it even for a minute. Um, quickly, want to just get your thoughts on what Amanda Nunes did to Chris Cyborg. You fought Chris Cyborg for her to beat her like that that quickly. Were you shocked? I don't think anything shocks me. Uh, I was. I I wouldn't have put the fight exactly that way. Um, I think. Styles make a difference, and that's all there is to it. And this is one of the best, biggest examples of that. If you look at someone like Shevchenko versus Nunez, Shevchenko fights at 125 now, and Nunez had this fight at 145. That's a big change. But the Shevchenko-Nunez fight was closer, and that just shows how much a style can make a difference in a fight. You know, you have two people that want to go in and slug it out. Somebody's going to land a shot. You have someone trying to, you know, Shevchenko's more of maybe a counter puncher. So there's she didn't necessarily come out with the win, but it just shows that styles make a difference and that, you know, uh, with the fight with Amanda and I, would be a whole different story as well. So I definitely know Amanda has knockout power. How many people has she finished with knockout power? We know that. And before the fight, I even said that I, I thought if it went in the later rounds for sure, it'd be, um, Cyborg's fight just because she, even if she's tired, she'll still power through, you know, she has a lot of heart and she'll keep, she'll keep going through um and then the ground scrambles who knows maybe it would have been Nunez and I said but you never know Nunez might land you know a hard shot she has knockout power you never know what's going to happen I knew that it was kind of um a loose cannon there like a you know it was just a ticking time bomb that was going to explode at some point any one of them could have landed a shot so um I can't say I was super shocked I say wow I, I didn't actually think it was really going to go that quickly in that way but I wasn't shocked by it. Would it be fair to say all goes well against Aspen Ladd? You want Amanda Nunes next at 135? That would, be, that would be very fair to say. Yes. At 135, right? 135, yeah. Okay. I think she kind of mentioned she wanted to go back to 135 anyway. I'm not yeah. sure. But. Yeah. Um, is the UFC on board with this? Like, is this the number one contender fight on March 2nd? You know, I haven't really talked to him. I'm sure Lenny has. I'm, I'm, Lenny, mean, that's my manager. Yes. I feel like, um, I don't really want to focus too much on that because I've got Aston Ladd in front of me. I don't want to think if this, then that I want to think, no, this, 
this is what I have right now. I have Aspen Lad right now, and she has a lot of things I have to uh, prepare for, and I don't want to overlook that. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to focus on this, and then we'll go from there. I always say one fight at a time because you're never promised another day. So as far as my, I'm concerned, my timeline just goes to March 2nd. And then after that, we'll see what happens. And I do believe off the top of my head, but I could be wrong because I'm doing this off the top of my head. Is this the first time that you fight on the same card as, as your teammate, John Jones? It is the first time. Yeah. And I always wondered if that was ever going to happen, if John and I would be on the same, team, uh, same fight card. Um, and here it is it's happening. Uh, also, Diego Sanchez. So That's we've got right. three of us in a fight camp right now. And I'm excited for it. It keeps that energy good and positive, and we're all, you know, chasing greatness together. So how can that not feel strong, and how can that not motivate me? So, Holly, great to catch up with you as always. I really appreciate you, you doing you this. Well. Thank you so much for the time. Good luck in training, and looking forward to Thank seeing you. you out there on March 2nd. All right. Look forward to it. Thank you. There she is, the one and only Holly Holmes stopping by. Big fight for her on March 2nd against Aspen Ladd, who has looked very good in the UFC, looked incredible in her last fight. She looks like a young, sweet girl, but uh, she is an absolute beast in there, and uh, that is a very important fight at 135, and I wouldn't be surprised if the winner of the fight could very well be next in line for a title shot at 135. Nunez home is a fight that hasn't happened. Um, and I know home has had her title shots in the past, but that is a fresh matchup and an interesting style matchup. I really appreciate uh, her opening up the way she did uh, regarding her personal issues that came out, I think, on TMZ a couple of weeks ago and never an easy thing. Um, and I can imagine as you're preparing for a fight, which is uh, very stressful in its own right to be going through that, uh, had the the pleasure back when she beat uh, Ronda Rousey to meet her husband at the time um, and was very nice and sorry to hear that uh, that has happened but it is a part of life as they say and uh, I really appreciate her opening up the way she did um, it was I think for a lot of people probably interesting to hear how someone in her position deals with something like that especially living in the public eye so um, in a matter of moments we are going to be joined I do believe by one Jorge Masvidal he returns to action on March 16th you'll recall the initial plan it seemed to be um, was for him to fight one Nick Diaz on March 2nd that fight never materialized in fact Nick Diaz telling me that he never really was offered the fight and well, this seems to be a common theme uh, these days with the Diaz boys, and uh, we're not really sure where it all kind of breaks down in terms of communication, but in the end, that fight is not going to happen, and he is going to fight Darren Till on March 16th in London. That's a fight that you can see if you're living here in the United States on ESPN+. Plus. So it's Till's return fight. He's back in England fighting in the main event. Big spot uh, for him course had the title fight uh, against Tyron Woodley after he beat Wonderboy Thompson who we spoke to last week in Liverpool now fighting in nearby London in the headliner and I do believe that uh, things are going well for one Darren Till as I'm about to drop my phone here I wanted to tell you as we're waiting for Jorge Masvidal uh, because my friends were reminding me this um Tickets for the event go on general sale Friday at 10 a.m. GMT, which is, uh, what is that, uh, five hours ahead of us. So 5 a.m. here in the tri-state area via Access and Ticketmaster. So that's this Friday at 10 a.m. GMT. That's where tickets uh, go on sale for the UFC's return to London. Also on that card is one Gunnar Nelson versus Leon Edwards. So that's an important fight as well at... 170 pounds, uh, main and co-main. So we'll talk to Jorge Masvidal in a matter of seconds here. If we can't get him on Skype, let's just do phone because I do believe that we are stressed uh, for time. And uh, then we'll go to Darren Till. We'll talk to Darren Till about his big uh, return fight. And then still to come, it's Demetrius Johnson. Talk to him about his one championship debut and also talk to one Henry O.K. Corrales, who is the owner of one of the very best nicknames in all of mixed martial arts. O.K. Corrales, that's great. Speaking of the welterweight division, uh, Bellator announced on Saturday that Roy McDonald will, in fact, defend his title in April, April 27th to be exact, against John Fitch. That's the Bellator 170-pound title, so uh, an important fight for them. And, of course, Rory coming back after the loss to Gegard Mousasi. By the way, Gegard Mousasi versus Ryan Bader. I didn't ask Bader about this, but Mousasi versus Bader is a pretty damn awesome fight. Mousasi coming up. He's fought at 205 before. 
this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now, but that would be an amazing fight. And I feel like it's a fight that, you know, would be very competitive. But that's not happening. What is happening? Jorge Masvidal versus Darren Till, March 16th in London. Game Bread joins us on the phone right now. Jorge, how are you? I've been better, my brother. What's up? What's wrong? Man, I ain't ate food yet. I've been waiting for you since 2.45. I hope you had Bruce Lee on the show. That's why you, you pushed me back so much. Because I know you had Bruce Lee on the show or something like that. Okay, my bad. I'm sorry. Well, someone was late and then it kind of uh, ruined everything for us. So I apologize for that, Jorge. I'll make this quick. Why, why aren't nah, you? you don't have to make it quick. You just got to buy me lunch when I'm in New York now. Anytime. For you, I'll buy you lunch anywhere in the world. I'll come to Florida tomorrow to buy you lunch uh, to apologize. Nah, that's okay, man. I'm not going to wait for you, bro. <laughs> okay. But yeah, when I'm in New York, you got me. Okay. Um, why aren't you, it, it, to the best of your knowledge, why aren't you fighting Nick Diaz on March 2nd? Man, I, could be a lot of things. I don't like to speculate on somebody's situation because I don't have his contract. I don't talk to his manager. I don't talk to Nick. But it could be numerous things. Maybe his fine that he has in California, after he's done paying that, he doesn't make a lot. Maybe the UFC doesn't want to cover that fine. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they told him something like it's happened to other people and then they didn't do it. I, I don't know. Maybe they offered him all the money he wanted and he still said no. It's many variables and factors. But really, the one that comes down to is I don't give a fuck. I got to fight, man. That's what I'm here for. You know, I, I don't even want to talk about that. That's so behind me. Okay. I'm in the future. I'm in the driver's seat headed towards England there until March 16th. You like this fight? I love this fight because it's a fight, man. I just wanted to fight. I was ready to take a fight in a week's notice. Somebody fell out from New York. Abe was calling me to ask me if I knew anybody. They wanted to fight a guy that had like two fights in the UFC, and I was like, you know what? No, they they uh they said that their Skype was down. Oh, well, what? and uh and I was ready to take the fight, but then I remembered New York has these weird no drug policy things. I was like, nah, I can't do that. Yeah. What what what? Do that. Why why what what was wrong? There was a freaking THC in the system, buddy. I'm not oh. getting suspended with THC in New York. I'm not I'm not gonna give nobody my purse and suspend me because you know I'm I'm a natural type of guy and I freaking you know yeah no no I no. did some natural things. You know you think it's right to get suspended for that? No. Because if I would have taken a week's notice, it would have showed up in the test. I remember when I fought in New York, I got I didn't smoke for maybe about a month. You know. Okay, yeah, no, 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 we don't want that, we don't want that. And it's not worth it. I mean, I know you were trying to save the day there and all, but, like, what does that win no, really no, do no, for you? No, 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 Because at the end of the day, I like to fight. This is this is my enjoyment in life. This is one of the things that I, I get thrilled about, you know? Right. So I wasn't trying to save no days, man. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I understand Darren, you know, sometimes has a hard time finding an opponent to fight him, especially in England. Um, I would imagine when they came to you with this opportunity, you were all over it. This is a big spot, right? Uh, we, were, we, we had to go back and forth for contracts and stuff like that, you know. But nobody's excited to fight in England. I think England's judging. Man, it's just it's not another world of bad. And I'm sure they're going to qualify me for this. But uh, it's bad. I mean, Dan Henderson versus that one-night dude. What happened there, bro? He beat the crap out of him, man. He went over there and beat the crap and knocked him down, wrestle fucked him, did everything that a man could do to another man to just get a five round decision. You know, he might have lost a round or two, but clearly Dan Henderson won and clearly he got ripped off bad, you know. It's, right. It's uh it's really home cooking decisions over there. I don't like that, but isn't this a civilized sport? Isn't this <laughs> we're so in the future? Isn't this trained individuals watching what's going on, or is it just get a guy from Manchester City and get his cousin and get his sister, and then you know give the decision to the guy that is just from England that survived? It doesn't sound right to me, man. But I don't care. That's that. I don't think about those things. Once I'll be in, I'll just be take his head off. You know. Uh, are you surprised that he's staying at 170 after all the troubles that he's had cutting down to welterweight? I don't, I mean, I don't know, bro. I don't know his current situation here, so I'm not surprised or, or anything. I just, I just hope he makes weight and he's a professional, you know, because if you can't make 170, mm -hmm. times, why, why are they keeping you at 70, you know? And when, when does it become a sport? Just because if you're a face of the sport, you get to miss weight. I don't get it. How does it work? You know, because I've never missed weight. And I used to cut probably just as much as weight as him or more at 155 because at 155, I'm a solid big dude, you know, and I would cut a lot of weight, and I tell you something, Eric, I signed on that paper saying I will make this weight, and I'm a man, and I go about my business, and I get it done, you know? Yes. So it's, uh, 
people need to step up to the plate. You say you're going to do it, just do it, man. Especially that missing four or five pounds. Just, let's just fight that fucking two. Okay, so so what happens? if he, Have you thought about that? Is there like a plan in place? If he misses the weight, what are you going to do? Touching. <laughs> so they're going to pay you? They're going to pay me no matter what. Sure. I got to go over there, fight the judges, and tell they got to pay me. Now, if he misses weight, we're talking about a different tax bracket. Okay, okay. All right. So you're going in there. You're, you're public enemy number one over there. You're fighting everyone. I'm, that's always me, man. That's true. And you haven't fought in a long time. Do you miss it? Like, by the time you actually fight, it's going to be like a year and a half since your last fight. I know you were on that reality show, which your boy Yoel is on now. You see Joel on there? He's kicking butt. Sure, man. Kicking butt, man. I mean, <laughs> and those courses are not built for somebody that big. How do you know, Game Bird? Because I was there 14 weeks doing them. And and I was having trouble with some of them because it's just like they're built more for the smaller parkour dudes that are little rats, cockroaches getting into these obstacle courses. I can't even imagine how much Joel's suffering in there, you know? And he's still doing great, man. It's incredible. Yeah, his son, I mean, and he's probably one of the older ones, I would imagine, on the show as well. No, he, he is the oldest one. He's Papa Smurf. He's 41 years old <laughs> doing the damn thing. Uh, but as far as fighting is concerned, how much did you miss actually fighting? And now we're, we're looking at the El Muerte, by the way. You could have seen this if you were on VSK. We just saw the El Muerte, Jorge. I'm trying to make it famous over yeah. here. Oh, shit. Well, I'm, I'm here logged on to the Skype, to the, the American Top Team account, uh, okay. John, and, and you guys couldn't call me, man. I don't know. I was it's ready fine. to roll. It's okay. It's okay. I appreciate you making the effort. Um, But but as far as, like, the, the length of time since you fought, do you feel like you're you're a little rusty? Like, do you feel like you're back in the swing of things? You're still getting, you know, you're, you're still getting warmed up again, cutting some weight? How, how do we feel mentally as, as the fight is approaching in a month and a half? Mentally, I feel better than I have in a really, really long time, you know? Maybe the the freshness. Hey, I'm doing an interview right now. I'm kind of busy, <laughs> and uh, and things like that. I feel great, man. Yo, I said I'm busy. No, I'm, uh, Richie. Do you know Richie Puma? Ariel Hawani is trying to get on the show, man. Wow. Uh, Ariel Hawani. You might have heard of him. ESPN. Yes. No, I've never heard of him. Never heard of him. Okay. Well, give me a second. Sir. That's the thing when you do interviews at Top Team, you don't know who's gonna just <laughs> rattle through the door, guns blazing. All right, my boy. What's up, Ariel? Hello. How are you, Richie? Excellent. How about yourself? Oh, I'm doing well, thanks. It's good to hear from you. We're what? talking to Jorge. Oh, must be a slow news day. Give me a second there, bud. <laughs> wow. You know, when Colby's on the show, he they give him like an office all by himself. He has a whole nice setup. You don't get the same treatment? It's uh, There's some racism going on, maybe. You know, they don't like the... <laughs> Olive color dudes or something. I don't know, bro. Okay. Um, but you you said it's it's been a while since you felt this good mentally. Why? Well, I had the start of the last year, I had a couple of injuries. I nursed them out, did a little bit of rehab. I didn't want to go under the knife. I'll tell you what, I'm scared to be put to sleep. So I've been lagging this injury for a little bit. And I'm just like, nah, man, I'm just going to rehab it out. Thank God everything's pretty good. I feel great. Then I went on that show, had a completely different experience. Got to be by myself a lot. And it was just awesome. No outside influences going into my temple. Just me with my own thoughts, my own mind capacity, and, and just exploring nature and myself at the same time, you know. And it's something that Joel, I'm sure when Joel, when you get him on the show and you ask him, if he spends over like seven, eight weeks over there, he'll see, he'll talk to you how good that isolation is is for you, you know. It's just good, man, not to wake up and have 100 text messages and you have 100 different emotions. Fuck all that, man. I can't wait to go back into seclusion and tell you the truth. Wow. When are you going to go back? Right after this fight, I'll disappear, man. Or oh, actually, before the fight, I'll be in, in a little bit of a, you know, can't kind of find me stuff, you know, from everything from debt collectors to mm -hmm. stalker chicks, things like that. I got to go under the radar. <laughs> I got to disappear, bro. <laughs> what? Well, everyone's hitting you up. Stalkers, debt collectors. This, this is very stressful <laughs> as you're preparing for a big fight. Especially in the Latin community, people see me on TV and they think they have this conception that I'm rich. Those are just rumors, man. <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody's hitting me up. Hey, I lend you $27 back in sixth grade. What's up? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Nah, man, that was in sixth grade. This is fucking, this is now. Yeah, of course. And there's like, there's a statute of limitations there. I mean, it kind of, it kind of runs out. Hell yeah, especially in Florida. It's like 13 hours. By the way, spe <laughs> speaking of Florida, um, there's a report that they're going back to Miami finally after all these years. But I understand that's April 27th, so not long after your fight. But I understand you don't like fighting in Miami, right? 
Uh, in the in the past, I haven't liked fighting in Florida too much, but um, a couple of things have changed around for this, and and your boy could get hella paid to fight Miami, so oh. I wouldn't mind. I'm actually trying to fight in that card. You know, some things could go really well for me as far as uh sponsorships go and things like that. So um, I would love to give the city a great show. Also, they they need they need me so the masses will turn out from my city, you know, and, and just give them a big, uh, here you go. You're welcome for, for this, uh, a world-class guy that's from this city. You got to come out and support him, man. I'm not some basketball player. that got drafted. It's not from, here. No, I'm from here, born and raised in the city. People are going to go nuts if I'm on that card, you know, yeah. especially my fans from day one from the street fighting days. Those people are going to lose their mind. That'd be incredible. What a spot. I mean, to me, when I think of like Miami MMA, you're the first guy that comes to mind from the backyard Hello. to the American Airlines arena. Damn skippy, man. Yeah. Uh, so have you told them this, that you want to make a quick turnaround and be on that card? Yeah, yeah, we've told them. Okay. I mean, that's why they were offering me other fights, uh, and we were like, man, we'll just hold out to Miami. Once we got close enough, we're like, wait up, you're offering me fights in March. I mean, they won't be able to turn around in Miami. So we wanted to take fights in February. They were like, oh, we can't find no card, nobody to fight you in Feb. But in March, we got some spots. I was like, if I fight in March, I won't get to fight Miami. We'll just wait for Miami then. But I was eager to fight. And then the hotel situation happened. And, uh, bam, we're fighting in, in England, you know. It's a yeah. big event. It's, uh, I get to test the waters and, and have fun and push myself, you know, against a big, strong dude that's a, a young lion. So I'm, I'm eager to get in there and scalp him up, you know. Are you going to go there super early to get acclimated, the weather, the time difference, all that stuff? I don't know about all that, man. I just I just go with the universal flow. I might show up a couple of days before. I might show up ten <laughs> days before. I don't know. I haven't I haven't thought that far yet. Okay, and I, I think this is the first time you fight in in Europe, right? Yeah, first time I fight in England, not in Europe. I, I'm, is Russia considered Europe? Yeah, it is. Oh yeah, back in the day you fought there, right? Um, for Bodog. Yeah. Saint Saint Petersburg, buddy. Saint Petersburg. Yeah, that's a big that's a big city there. Um, but but never in England. Man, that's crazy. No, All, I've only been on mail with England. 45 fights you've had, and you've only fought in Europe once. Yes, sir. I'm a little surprised. I mean, I don't know. I, I fought in Asia a lot, though, so that's I right. like that. Um, I don't want to keep you uh, uh, hanging around too long because I know that you're hungry. What are we having for lunch? Nah, Jorge? I don't even worry. You know, I was just messing with you. Earlier. Okay, I'm I got good. really afraid. I was afraid. I was like, man, did I piss off Jorge? I mean, I feel like nah, we're cool. no. I got really worried. I got a lot of other people mad at me these days. No. I don't know if you know this. Yeah, you can piss me off, man. This is a long time bond, bro. Yeah, but you know, you know, if you see Michael Bisping out there, now we got a problem. Are we still I holding? I don't on? want no problem. We're still holding I on to this me. this beef with you and Bisping, huh? I mean, what would you do if you're pushing your, your, your son in a carriage and then some fucking heathen with one eye comes talking shit, putting his fingers in your face? Oh. It's all on video. I'm with my son pushing a carriage and this guy's acting a fool. And then I could have returned the favor to him in China when I seen him with his wife and his freaking kids. And I didn't say a damn thing. I just looked at him and I was like, all right, bro. And I just walked away because that's what men do. I'm not going to make a show in front of women and children. That's that's not even acceptable like yeah. oh, from man to man like all right you get the past you're with your family but when i see you we can talk like men but he didn't do that for, for for me you know so for indefinitely when i see that guy i'm gonna make his life uncomfortable you know and and that's the end of it you know that that's how it is man I, I don't know where he was raised maybe he was raised by fucking i don't know somebody with no uh no etiquette like bro you you, you can't even even the dumbest of people know, like, man, if you see somebody with their family, leave them alone, bro. Come back another day. The guy's an idiot. There's a reason he has one eye. Well, luckily for all involved, next is Darren Till, March 16th, London. Tickets go on sale this Friday at 10 a.m. local time. I'm looking forward to it, Jorge. Big fight for you. I know you didn't get the Nick Diaz fight. I would argue potentially bigger, especially when you consider uh, the location as well. Great to catch up with you, Jorge. Thank you for doing this. No, no problem, man. Thank you for having me on the show, man. Okay. So there's Jorge Masvidal. Now let's talk to the man that he will be facing on March 16th, Darren Till. Okay, we're not talking to Darren Till. We'll be talking to him in a matter of seconds here. Um, <laughs> this is uh, He's going to be joining us. He is the other part of that equation on March 16th in London. Uh, the return of one Darren Till, who, of course, fought in Liverpool. What a scene that was. And now I think we do have him. Do we not have him? Okay, I'm getting mixed messages here uh, from the team in the back. It is total chaos back there, but I'm doing well over here, just to let you know. Um, Till fought Wonderboy, came back, fought 
uh, Tyron Woodley lost that fight and then now is returning to action. And you'll recall that I spoke to him not that long ago and he said that he was, you know, there was a report that came out that said that he wanted to fight at 185. Um, and then he came on the show, we spoke to him, and he said that now he was reconsidering 185. He was going to stay at 170. He's had his issues in the past making 170. And in the end, he stays at 170. How about that? Bit of a surprise. I thought maybe he would uh, return at 185. Also became a father once again recently. Uh, and uh, there was a while, I even talked to him about this the last time we spoke, there was a while that he was uh, quiet on Twitter and social media, but uh, not this past weekend. This past weekend was very entertaining, I thought. Um, so I think in a matter of seconds, we'll be joined by Darren Till. After that, we'll talk to Henry Corrales and then Demetrius Johnson. Darren, are you there? You know what time it is. I know what time. There he is, Darren Till. Great to talk to you, my friend. And th and thanks for your patience as we were trying to sort all that out. How are you doing, Darren? I'm good. I'm just finished training, mate. Feeling very good. Darren, uh, when I said to people that you were going to be on the show today, uh, the number. What do you think the number one question was? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, they, they were asking me, what were you on about this past weekend on Twitter? It seemed like you were going in a million different directions, talking about a lot of different people. Where was that coming from? You know what I'm like, Ariel? I don't tweet a lot, but when I tweet, <laughs> yes. I go full, full ammo. <laughs> what was going on? Why were you so riled up? I just, you know, it, it, it's just good. People love it, Ariel. People love the smack talk. They do love the smack talk. It seemed like, all right, by the way, are you driving right now? No, I'm I'm banding, Ariel. Got my man driving. Okay, good. I was worried there for your safety. I don't want you to drive and talk to me at the same time, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, Darren, but we have a fight to headline on March 16th. Tickets go on sale this Friday. You know what time it is, Ariel? Sell out in, in minutes. Yeah, is that what you were expecting? Yeah, hopefully. that That's, that, you know, it just shows if, if people, if it sells out quick, people definitely are interested in I think the whole card's great I think I think the main event the co-main I think um, you know the whole main card the prelims I think I think it's one of the best events London's ever had so you know very good uh, last time I spoke to you Darren you talked about weighing your options am I going to try 185 or am I going to stay at 170 in the end why did you choose 170 just because I think I've still got some unfinished business left at 170 there's a lot of fights I want and you know, I did make the cut last time. There was no problems. I made 169. So why why not? Like, you know, why not stay there? So we'll, we'll see, mate. You know, I've got some unfinished business. I don't want to, you know, go up to 185 and leave some unfinished names to get dealt with. So, you know. At some point in the future, is that something you want to try? Yeah, definitely. You know, everybody knows I love eating cakes and pies. So I'm definitely going to 185 soon. Okay. Um, soon. So, so it's in the near future. Yeah, of course. Okay. Did they even talk to you about that? Did they offer you 185 for this for this card? They just they. I didn't really speak to the media. They spoke to my uh, my coach, and my coach was just like, you know, we, we can do whatever. And 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 the, the decision was made to stay at 170, and 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 obviously now we we've got an opponent, you know, Masvidal. Okay. Uh, what did you make of that opponent? Because I know there were a lot of people that you know who are at your disposal. Um, a lot of names that you could potentially fight. They end up with Jorge Masvidal. Was that a matchup that you liked? Yeah, because I called Masvidal out for UFC Liverpool. So he called me for London. So I accepted and, and, and here we are fighting each other. Now, what's happening between you? Can we talk about a Ben Askren? Because I find that your back and forth is very entertaining, I must say. <laughs> uh, what is happening? What is the, the, the crux of the issue here? There's no issue. <laughs> Ben's a prick. <laughs> I'm not, and that's it. <laughs> okay, is this someone that you would like to fight before you move up to 185? Yeah, this is, yeah, of course. I'm not scared of Ben at all. Ben's. I remember years ago when when I when when I was in Brazil and my wrestling coach Tim. He, yeah, there it is, Dave. I'm left here. Just drive on. Just keep driving. I remember when my wrestling coach Tim used to talk about Ben all the time and 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 big him up. And so I've known about Ben for years and. You know, Ben come to the UFC and is talking shit to everyone, and a lot of people didn't respond. So, you know, who am I not to respond to Ben and and and, and talk some shit? He, the thing is, Ben doesn't know how to take me because he tries to be all intelligent, and I just I just saw all bullshit. 
and he just, you know, he doesn't know how to react to that. So it is what it is, mate. I like it. You're the only one who actually responded to him. In the end, he doesn't end up fighting you. I, I thought it would have been a fun fight. He ends up fighting the one guy who didn't, uh, you know, really get any trash talk from him, Robbie Lawler. But uh, nevertheless, you have Masvidal. But you did say also, and I just want to confirm this with you, RDA, Ponzinibbio, they were both offered you, and, and, and you're saying they said no? What I was told, Ariel, is that they met privately to make a fight with each other. Oh. And... So, you know, they, whether they want to fight me or don't is besides the point. I was told they were they met up to make a fight with them two in Argentina and that fight's not happening because the UFC didn't like the way they went about it. So, I don't know, mate, what the... What the but Ponzinibbio, I don't know why after his last fight he said, like, I'm, 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 I think he said, like, I'm a cheat and, and I'm not professional, you know. So, I don't know why he said that because... Okay, I miss weight, and I've, I've I've talked about that. I've said it's my fault. But why would he? Why would he come out and say he doesn't want to fight me because I'm not professional? You know, I take I take I take the sport very seriously. I, but besides all the Twitter bullshit and, and and everything else that I do, I, I take my sport seriously, and and and, and you know, I, I don't cut no corners. So for him to say that, I, I just felt it was a little bit disrespectful towards me. You know, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's someone that maybe at some point is that is that cop for you guys? No, it's not for you guys. Well, that would have been something, right? <laughs> hey, you fucking bacon! <laughs> you bacon threats! What is that? Is that a Liverpool term? Yeah, oink, oink. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yes, 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 yes. I think I've heard of that one. Um, all right, so uh, what about the, the weight cut as far as this one? Like, are you going to try to replicate the same thing that you did for the Woodley fight? Because that one seemed yeah. to go really well. I've got my chef coming again on Friday. Oh. Uh, all He's coming Friday, so we'll have seven weeks to get our, you know, knuckle down and do the weight cut. You know, the last fight with Woodley, I concentrated on weight, and, and, and I should have been concentrating on a monster like that, you know, one of the best welterweights ever, but it didn't, because in my head I thought, he's scared of me, I'm going to beat him, fuck him, let's concentrate on weight, and, and, and I should have done it the other way around, but, you know, I'm not going to lie here, I let, I, let, I let, you know, some people get into my head, and haters and stuff, and... and that's why I was so nervous and, 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 and stuff like about the weight cut. So, you know, I've learned from my mistakes and I feel like you have to learn. Woodley had three losses to get to the position he's in, you know, and, 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 and I felt like since my loss, I took it like a man and it is what it is, mate. Okay. Um, so do you feel different mentally? Like it's always interesting to see how a fighter responds from a title fight loss. Do you feel like you've learned something from that experience? Are you already feeling different as you prepare for this big fight? Yeah. I, I, it's hard to say. I don't know how fighters deal with defeat, but I've just dealt with it. I I know where I went wrong, mm. and and I know that it wasn't through my mistakes on that night. I know that the better man still won. I'll always say that, but I, I just don't really give a fuck, mate. To be honest with you, I still think I'm the best fighter in the world. I'll always believe that, and and. And March 16th, I'm, I'm coming out with everything, 100%. I am coming with everything. So Masvidal needs to come with everything because I, I, I'm coming with everything I've got. And when you say that you let some people get you, do you mean the fans, the the, the, the people there's, online? There's people, there's people who get in, in your ear and, 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 you know, yeah, obviously, you know, people on, online and, and just, you know, just the constant questions of weight cuts. Yeah. The, the, the last fight was wasn't about the fight it was about like when i made i think there was more people there to watch me make weight than there was <laughs> the fucking arena <laughs> so that's what i mean ariel do you know what i mean I, you know I, i'm not gonna sit here and say yeah I'm, I'm the mentally most strong person in the world with stuff I, I do think i'm a very strong mental person but yeah i did let people get to me because i was embarrassed by, by the, the wonder boy fight not making weight i felt like it dampened the win and the event and the show and, and, and to make it worse, after the fight, Wonderboy just kept talking about it. His dad kept talking about it. So it kept it fresh in people's minds. Whereas two weeks before that fight with Wonderboy, Yo Yo Romero missed weight for the title fight. So it was like I was the, the, the big attention was on me. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I, as I said, I was never like the guy who's the only guy who missed weight. So I don't even want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. Okay. Uh, how's the new baby? She's good. She's mate. She's very good. She's like a little King Edward's potato. She's like a little potato. <laughs> How's so this? people keep people keep coming up to me in the street and saying she looks like you. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm just like, 
You know, she looks like a fucking potato. She doesn't look like anyone. <laughs> <laughs> How's the sleeping though? It's, it's good, mate. I got a props to me, uh, my girlfriend. She's she's uh, she's being a soldier. She's a uh, you know, she lets me get me sleep while you know waking up for training, and you know, I, you know, I do me shifts with her. But you know, props to my girlfriend, mate. She's 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 been a star. Uh, I think a lot of people thought that on Saturday when you were tweeting all that stuff that you were up feeding her. Is that what was happening? <laughs> I'm not prepared to say. <laughs> <laughs> or... Just just clarify though, I was not drunk. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Fair enough. Um, uh, also, people think that. Sorry, mate. No, go ahead. Go ahead. People just think that every time Till's on Twitter, he's had a drink. Not true. Okay. Uh, Eddie Hearn also was uh, feeling your wrath as well. I saw that one. <laughs> what's what's your beef yeah. with Eddie Hearn? I just... Listen, mate, I'm no one. I'm no one. But every time I see an interview with Eddie Hearn and Joshua, the only thing I hear coming out of their mouths is money and business. Hmm. Whereas... When you look at interviews like with Mike Tyson and Fury and, and, and people like that, there was never any talk about business. Like, me and, like, you know, I don't think about the paychecks and who's the A side or whatever until after the fight. I, I just want to fight. And then after my fight, you know, appreciate the money and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I do understand business and, 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 and Joshua definitely should be getting the most money. He's the biggest star in the world but every fucking interview it's business 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 money 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 we've offered this we've offered that just let's fucking let them fight just yeah. just shut the fuck up <laughs> okay fair enough yeah the fans don't want to hear that stuff right i don't and i'm a fan of, right of, of the heavyweights right now so i'm a fan and, and i'm just sick of it and 60 40 splits I couldn't agree more. I think you speak for all of us, or at least the majority of us. Well, this is a lot of I, fun. Get, yes, go ahead. I speak from the heart, Ariel, whether you like me or not. That's right. I always speak from the heart. And you know what I love? You and Mike Perry once had that little issue in Poland. Now I see you guys DMing each other. You're giving each other nice messages, pleasantries. The the, the budding friendship between you and Mike Perry, even, even like <laughs> past what happened in L.A. with the whole spa thing, like that, the fact that this is still going, it warms my heart. You two are great together. Listen, Ariel, right? I've got beef with everyone in that welterweight division, but that does not mean that I do not respect them as fighters because they all have families, they all have bills to pay. So as fighters, I respect them. But if they say, fuck me, I say, fuck you. And if they want to fight, I say, let's fight. I, I, so, you know, it, that, that's, just how, that's just how I, I go, with, go about fighting. I, 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 I think that's why fans love you. And... Masvidal is that kind of guy as well. I, mean, I feel like you're from very different neighborhoods. You're from very different worlds. But at your core, very similar. No nonsense. You respect me. I respect you. You yeah. don't respect me. I don't respect you. I think Masvidal probably comes from a lot worse a place in, in Cuba. Is Masvidal from Cuba, right? Yeah. Yeah, originally, yes. Yeah. I don't know the background, but, you know, he's he's been through it all. So it, it is what it is, mate, you know. I just want to fucking punch a hole in his face and he probably doesn't want us. He wants to do the same. So we'll see. Darren, I'm looking forward to it. Welcome back. It's good to have you back in the mix. March 16th, Thanks. London, England, the return of Darren Till against one Jorge Masvidal. What a great fight. Can't wait for I it. I just want to give a shout out please, to, to, to my coach, Ariel, because he, he's, he is the best coach on this planet and, and, and everything he does for me is from the heart he doesn't care about money he doesn't care about anything he, he, he's the best person in the world and I, do, I want him to know that and is that your coach Colin? Colin he, he, there's, there's not a man alive like him wow okay um, and, yeah. and, and, and speaking of your team let's get Mike Grundy on that card is that going to happen? we'll see mate oh we'll see. wait you know something? what do you know Darren? what's that smile say? I what's that? <laughs> I know a lot of things, Ariel. <laughs> <laughs> well, th that seems promising, at least. That's it. Maybe they'll yeah. maybe they'll announce it this week. All I know, Ariel, is that the O2, they spoke to the UFC and they said, we want Till as the main event. Oh, wow. So, I, I appreciate stuff. I, you know, I still can't believe I'm on my fourth main event. So, 
if, if I do have a little bit of push and power on this event, hopefully, you know, I'm obviously I'm going to push for my teammate, Mike Grundy. Up, up to now, the card is unbelievable. But, you know, I've said it time and time again, a guy like Mike Grundy, he, he, he just deserves that shot and opportunity. So we, we'll see, Ariel. Okay. Good luck to him. Good luck to you, Darren. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate you doing it in the car. Much love, much respect. See you out there March 16th. Good luck. There he is, the one and only Darren Till stopping by. Great stuff from him. Always appreciate him stopping by. It's always hard to get him and actually get him to show up. But once he does, he's a good time. All right. Now, let us put Bellator on Saturday night to bed. One of the big stories I told you multiple times today, Henry Corrales, Aaron Pico, a firefight if I ever saw one. Initially, Corrales gets dropped by Pico, the young stud, the rising star. But then Corrales, in, in, in perhaps a fight that is symbolic of his own life, comes back, gets on his feet, and knocks out the youngster, Aaron Pico. Wow, what a moment. Let's talk to Mr. Henry Corrales right now via the magic of Skype. He joins us right over there. Henry, how are you? Congratulations on the win. Hey, what's up, Ariel? Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks. First things first, how are your teeth, Henry? I, I understand that you lost your, your front teeth in the fight. They look great there, but how are they doing? These are dentures, yeah. I have, uh, I have these implants that my dentist takes out before I fight. Can I see what, what, what they look without the dentures? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my. That Oh, top and bottom. Holy smokes. Yeah. Wow. When did that Pretty happen? Uh, courtesy of Emmanuel Sanchez, dude. He got me in the first round with the knee right up the pipe. Bam. Damn. So when you smashed, fight, what do you watch? Six of my teeth, dude. And uh and I went to, I went to I still fought the whole fight like that. This split decision lost. All the nerves were exposed. Oh, Man, brutal. that must but, have been uh, horrible. horrible. So when you fight, you take the dentures out? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I take the dentures out and just throw them out and then get after it. Okay. Um, well, again, congratulations on the win. What a, what a performance, what a fight. I mean, it was so quick, but it was just incredible. It was, it was frenetic. When he dropped you early on, what is going through your mind, if anything? Thank you very much, dude. Uh, nothing much, you know. I was just, uh, was, he just shot it up the pipe underneath the jab. So I, I kind of blinded my own, my own, myself with my own shoulder, and he shot that up, that right up underneath it perfect shot that he threw you know and it just it dumped me on my ass dude but the the moment i realized what i got hit with i was i was good dude by the time i got up i circled out and i beelined right back to him like let's go did his power surprise you not so much dude it was just it was just that i didn't see it dude it's those punches that you don't see that are kind of like whoa what the fuck was that? right um and then, and then we're and we're watching it right over here you know he didn't back he didn't back down he kept going. Obviously, he was trying to end the fight, and he's talked afterwards about how that's something he maybe needs to work on. Did you did you sense that he was just being a little too overzealous? Did you feel like he was being a little too aggressive in that moment? Thought that maybe you were too wounded of an animal? I don't. Yeah, people were saying that, but I don't think he really was, dude. Okay. He was he was, compo he was composed, dude. His, both of his hands were up, and he was he was on me, dude, as you should, you know. Right. And uh, it's just the thing was, is I was recovered one hundred percent. And I was ready to go. And he, he maybe he got a little, uh, maybe he was shooting those left hands to the body a little too recklessly. He was digging hard, dude, to those body shots. And uh, there was like a split second thought that went through my mind, like, dude, that fucking head's open if he's shooting, if he's going so, if he's digging so hard to the body, and I just fucking slung one in there, dude. Uh, you, you've you been th that was your twentieth pro fight. Have you ever had more fun in a little over sixty, you know, sixty seconds in a fight before? What a trip! Yeah, these fights, these fights are getting funner and funner, man. This stage is getting bigger and uh, pretty exciting. Yeah, a little older, so I'm like a, little, a lot more present with the whole process, and it's just well, when you're younger, dude, you're just a savage. And you're like, fuck it, you're not processing shit, and you're not too conscious about it, and so it's really cool like, getting a little older, and you're like, damn. It's pretty Did you feel like you were being served up to him as as a stepping stone, as you know, as as a nice yeah. a nice name, but for well, him to keep going? Yeah, you know, with the signing bonus that they gave him and all the stuff, rumors that go around about the guy, uh, I think anybody who fights him at this point would pretty much be in that position as a stepping stone, you know. But you know, I wasn't, 
I wasn't phased by any of that stuff, dude. You know, I've been labeled a lot worse than this guy. So it's interesting because your Bellator career didn't get off on the right foot, but you fought some killers and you took fights on short notice. I mean, you fought the best of the best, Pitbull, etc. But now you're really putting everything together. You've looked very good as of late. We're looking at your last five fights, uh, won them all. Um, and it seems like, as you said, you're getting a little older, a little wiser. Is it? And I've heard about the story of you going to the lab and you know Benson Henderson being there and you've got great coaches there. Is it just that simple? change of, of scenery being with an established team or is there more to the story dude it's pretty it's that sim it's it's a simple story but you know it is complicated because you gotta put in a lot of fucking work and you gotta you gotta uh, put yourself and uh, put yourself out there you know and uh you know i definitely don't want to excuse those losses you know but there's some reasons behind them so uh you know we adjusted accordingly and we're just just keep chipping away and just keep moving forward man and um uh, yeah, I can't be. I couldn't. I literally couldn't be any great, more grateful for the MMA live and what it's done to my career. You know, that's five straight since joining them, and uh, just feel really blessed, man. How did you find them? Um, so my chick at the time, she started a doctoral program at ASU, and then my head coach took off to become the striking coach there, Eddie uh, Chaw. Yeah, they, they they hired him. They hired him as a full time striking coach, and I was like. What the fuck am I gonna do out here, dude? I'm over him. I'm not gonna stay here. My lady took off, and my head coach. I was like, "Well, fuck, I'm gonna leave too." So I went over there, and uh, it worked out, dude. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as of late, look very good. You have Benson in your corner. You've got great coaches in your corner. So it looks like it's all coming together. But I, I, I heard a story uh, that you told at the press conference that I felt like there needed to be a couple, at least a couple more follow-ups <laughs> about the story that where you got stabbed, and then then you nailed the guys with your skateboard. Can, can you repeat that story yeah. for me and then I can answer it? So is this, is this just a, a general – where did you grow up? Bro, it's just some typical fucking Southern California, Los Angeles County shit. Okay. You know, the, and the most stupid confrontations that go down. Like I was just walking on the board and uh, the sun was in my eyes, so I was probably making like a little face or something. And these fucking guys were like, what the fuck are you looking at like that? And I was just like, oh, the sun's in my eyes. Like I was trying to explain myself. But then I felt like a pussy because I had to just explain myself that the sun was in my eyes. I was like, you know what, fuck you. So I just took flight on them, and then one of them fucking stabbed me, and then uh, yeah, I had to defend myself with, with my little skateboard, dude. And uh, yeah, the story has to be cut short there before I incriminate it myself. Uh, where did you get stabbed? Uh, just a little tummy, little neck, dude. No big deal. Uh, no big deal. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have no, I didn't have no insurance, so I didn't go to the hospital or nothing. What did you do? I just, you know, I just fucking showed my friends and just fucking chuckled that in, kept it moving. Were you not bleeding? <laughs> no, I was fucking gushing, dude. But uh, <laughs> it, it closed the house. Yeah. Like, just I naturally. Did, well, dude, we were like rigged it. One of my buddies was just like, "Oh, dude, I fucking put some duct tape on it." You know, just fucking some little stoner, dude. This is like, "Oh, fucking put some duct tape on it, dude." And fucking a little fucking duct tape on it. <laughs> How many times you get stabbed as a kid? Only twice, dude. Only twice. <laughs> what, what, yeah, was the, <laughs> what was the second time? Dude, some chick stabbed me. I was beating up her boyfriend, dude. Like, what? Like, he was talking shit. Dude, people, dude, you go to the wrong places out here, dude. <laughs> You're younger and people talk shit. And I'm down to fight, dude. I like to fight, you know? Yeah. I, I came to martial arts from, from the dark arts, baby. And I was, I've always been ready to fucking go. And I never started shit, but I was fucking, I'm down to throw, dude. And uh, I just started scrapping some dude, and his lady fucking shanked me, dude. Wow. Yeah, and then she, yeah, and then she, and then she also stabbed my girlfriend at the time too. So that's kind of a whoa. Kind of, yeah. Where did she stab kind you? Ugly, dude. Uh, on the side. Okay. Yeah. Same spot. Yeah. Same area. Yeah. Okay. And what about your girlfriend at the time? Where did she get stabbed? I think she she got she got one in the little gut too. Wow. Uh, yeah. Did you go to the doctor? To the no, I went, I went. I I fucking I was all pumped, dude, from fucking scrapping. So I went to some like house party and <laughs> partying, and, she, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll go, I'll go to the hospital later." And I fucking never went, dude. <laughs> what? So you've been stabbed yeah, twice, a, and both dude, times, piece of shit, dude. no medical dude, attention. Dude. Yeah. Wow, that's. A, do you have scars? Uh, I have a little trouble on my tummy. Okay, so I I, I I like that term that you say: the dark arts to the martial arts. So was that just <laughs> your, your upbringing? You were yeah. just always in trouble, fights, things like that. 
Yeah, dude, just typical fucking typical stuff, dude. You know, mom's always working, and so I was being I was being raised by my dudes over here in the neighborhood that are fucking just a couple years older than me, you know. Right. Those guys are showing me the showing me the ways, and so uh, yeah, but nothing too crazy, you know what I mean? It's just it's a super undisciplined life, and no direction, and no, you know, just just no goals and shit, you know. Like my biggest thing was just to chase some puss and uh, get all fucking hammered with my boys and. You know, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad I came across martial arts, dude. Like, uh, I didn't start training cells in my early 20s, dude. You know, so I feel super fresh at this point. You know, I haven't taken too much damage, you know. Who who introduced you to martial arts? Who got you into it? Um, So I was in jail, like, I was like 22 or 23. And I was like, you know, having a fight in there. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Here? I'm like better than this, you know. Like I had like an epiphany at that moment, and I was like, dude, when I get out, like my buddy picked me up from jail, dude. And I was like, I was telling him, I was like, when I get out, dude, I'm gonna fucking, I'm gonna start training, dude. I'm gonna fucking, I'm gonna be a fighter and this and that. And then I've all, dude, I've been always so lucky. Like, dude, my people were fucking down for me, dude. My buddy was like, fuck, yeah, he's like, do it, you can do it for sure. You know, my mom, everybody, there's like, I'm gonna do it. You know, everybody was like, go for it. You've always been a fighter, do it. I was like, all right, cool. Like, I had to get, like, a lot of, like, partying and, like, having a chase novelty, dude. So I just had to get a lot out of my system before, you know, I gave this. And I haven't looked back. Dude, I haven't been in trouble since I started training. So it's just one of those stories, dude, that you always hear time and time again that how martial arts save people's lives. And, uh, you know, I feel it. I see it. And uh, I live it for staying, dude. Uh, why were you in jail? Uh, dude, like a warrant. A warrant uh, for... Uh, it was a DUI. Dude. I had a DUI when I was like a, a teenager. Okay. And I took care of it. I was like, I was like, fuck that. They, you know, they wanted me to pay some fine or something. And I was like, dude, I just took vacation from work and I just, I just went and did some time for it <laughs> instead of paying the fine. I was like, yeah, I got to go see my family in Mexico. <laughs> but really, I was just in jail for two weeks. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> was that the only time you were in jail? Yeah, when I went back to when I went back to work. No, I think I've been. Yeah, I got arrested for the first time when I was like four years old, dude. What? And, uh, <laughs> what? So I get back, went back to when I went back to work. I was. They're like, "How was Mexico?" And I was like, "Oh, it was fucking. It was cool." But really, I was like in jail, fucking like fighting people and just being a fucking retard. So wow. So you were in wild, jail, dude. You were in jail for two weeks and you got into a fight while you were there. Yeah. yeah. Wow, and that's what. Cha- yeah. So how many times have you been in jail? Yeah. Dude, nothing, nothing, no, no, nothing more than like a two week stint. You know, okay. Nothing serious, you know what I mean? Just fucking knucklehead stuff, dude. Just, just being a fucking rascal, you know. The first time I got arrested, I was like five years old, dude. Like me and my buddies were breaking some windows, and the cops are like, they, they fucking snatched us up, dude. And they're like, we're just putting this motherfucker in the system. And they took me to the fucking station and got my fingerprints right off the bat. What? <laughs> As a five year old? <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. They're like, they, the cuffs wouldn't even fit me. Like I took them off. I'm like, hey, these don't fit me, and I just took them off. They're like, yeah, just just sit there. Wow. They wanted to put me in the system, dude. What did your mom say? Knucklehead. <laughs> what did your mom say? Dude, my poor mom. Yeah, dude. My mom had dealt with a lot of shit, dude. Okay. Yeah. Jeez. And do you have siblings? She's, she's cool. She always, she always stuck with me. Yeah, I'm the middle child, dude. I have two older sisters and a younger brother and a younger sister. And, uh, yeah. They get into trouble, too? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, just me. Just oh. me. Now, older... My oldest, my oldest sister, she was, yeah, she, my oldest sister was a bit of a handful, but we're all fighters, dude. We all like to fight, dude. Like, it's in our blood. Okay. And I, I remember my oldest, me, me and my, my oldest sister, she's a scrapper, too. Me and her were like, yeah. She's, wow. Who gave you that nickname? Stories. Your nickname is awesome. Okay, Corrales is an amazing nickname. Thank you, dude. Uh, I was walking out to my pro debut, and my coach at the time, John DeLo, he's a fucking clown, dude. He's so fucking silly. I was walking out. It's my first fight, and then he, it's like Henry. Okay, and I was like, "What?" I looked back at him. And he's all chuckling. He's all laughing. He's all. Oh. Like he thought it was so funny, dude. And I was just like, "You fucking dick!" <laughs> and so, like a week later, I was like, "What? The, what is? What's okay?" And then uh, he's like, "You know, like the okay corral, like the gunfight," and and I'm just always down for everything. Like he's like, "Hey, these," because we shared a gym with pro boxers. He's like, "Hey, you got to spar this poor boxer." I'm like, "Oh, okay." Like, "Hey, flip these tires." I'm like, "Okay." Hey, uh, you're gonna make your pro debut this time. Okay, okay, okay. Like I'm just always down. I'm saying okay and stuff. So he's like, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's you great. Nickname yourself, dude. Like it kind of grew on me. 
it, it's going on me now, but I fucking hated it at first. I was like, dude, this is so good. No, it's perfect. <laughs> and also kind of symbolizes your fight on Saturday. It felt like a, an old gunfight at the at the OK Corral. I loved it. So afterwards, you said you want you want another shot at Pitbull. You want a title shot. You going to get it? That'd be nice, dude. That'd be nice. You know, belts work is a fuck what I want, you know. Hey, give it to me. Yeah, you know, why not? If, uh, Don't sell yourself short. You're Henry Corrales. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty much impossible for me not to put on a exciting fight. That's right. Well, I hope you get it, my man. And uh, I think you made a big statement on, on Saturday. And, and and by the way, how about Pico showing up, answering questions from the press? For a youngster, he's pretty damn mature, right? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know about that, but yeah, he's he's a good kid, dude. He's really, he's really good. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not worried about him, man. He's gonna fucking, he's gonna come back and start smashing it, dude. So I agree. Well, Henry, he's great to guy. meet you, man. Really, uh, team, so. what what a great backstory you have. Congratulations. Hey, thanks for having me, man. On on the victory, and uh, I, I wish you the best. Looking forward to talking to you again. I hope you get your title shot. Dude, this is so cool. I can't believe I'm even talking to you and. Thanks for having me, man. My pleasure. There he is, Henry Corrales. Wow, what a story, Henry Corrales. I uh, I didn't know that he had that kind of that backstory. Arrested when he was five. I have a I have a son who's who's six. I can't imagine him getting arrested. That is incredible. I do believe that uh, he has made a very strong case to be next in line for a belt. Uh, he came to Bellator. From King of the Cage, former King of the Cage champion. Lost to Daniel Strauss via guillotine. Lost to Emmanuel Sanchez. You saw his teeth there, right? Just, uh... And then fought Patricio Pitbull and lost to him via guillotine on short notice. Super short notice. Then he was supposed to fight AJ McKee. Uh, that fight never materialized. And then since then, he has won five in a row. So lost his first three fights in Bellator, has won five in a row, beat Cody Bollinger via uh, knockout, beat Noad Lahat via decision, beat Georgie Karhanian via decision, beat Andy Main via knockout. That was back in October. And then this uh, past weekend, beat Aaron Pico via knockout as well Henry Corrales 17 and 3 now wants another shot at Patricio Pitbull I did see uh the Pitbull brother well Patricio and and uh, Michael Chandler going back and forth on Saturday via Twitter as well so we'll see how that all materializes all right last up on the program the one and only Demetrius Johnson he'll be joining us the one of the newest members of one championship of course the longest reigning champion in UFC history uh, last fought in August against Henry Cejudo. And after that, got traded essentially for uh, Ben Askren, the aforementioned Ben Askren. And will be debuting for one championship on March 31st. I was curious how he uh, saw all the action on, on uh, January 19th in Brooklyn, how he felt about it all, and also about the state of the division that he made famous, that he carried for all those years. Uh, as I said earlier, briefly, starting to hear that a lot of fighters are being told essentially this. If you're coming off a loss at 125, uh, there's a very good chance that there isn't a home for you. If you're coming off a win, you have the option to go up to 135, or you can fight things out at 125 essentially until you lose. But it does seem as slowly but surely they are going to start phasing out the division. That seems to be what a lot of people are telling me right now. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see what they do with Henry Cejudo. If they do, in fact, grant him that immediate rematch against TJ Dillashaw. If it's at 135, that feels to me like an indication uh, that the, the flyweight days are numbered. And I know a lot of people said that Dana White's sort of, you know, his approach being sort of non-committal about the future of, of, of the division leading up to the fight. And then, of course, not coming out and saying what he wanted to do after the fight was a sign that the flyweight days were numbered. Uh, they have yet to come out and say, but I, I'm, I'm starting to hear louder and, and, and louder talk, if you will, that uh, it does seem like the days are numbered for the flyweight. So I'm curious to hear what DJ has to say 
about all of that. And then we shall say goodbye. Uh, no post show this week, but New York Rick and I will be back in your life later on this week. He will be on The Reporters. So I'm sure a lot of you are very excited about that. The brand new MMA Reporters podcast that you could subscribe on this very feed if you are listening to this via iTunes. New York Rick's going to be on there. We'll catch up with him. So don't worry. And a reminder that we're back on ESPN2, 1 a.m. Eastern, late night. Technically early Wednesday morning, 10 p.m. Pacific, if you're on the West Coast, Tuesday. All right? So, I do think that we are connecting with one Demetrius Johnson. I do think that he is going to be joining us, and it's a big deal for DJ to be joining us via Skype because he's a very busy man, but I coerced him into doing this via Skype. And so let us say hello to the longest reigning champion in UFC history, the one and only <laughs> Mighty Mouse. There he is. DJ, how are you? Doing it from the gym? Pancration? Oh, A.O.? Uh, Matt Hume, how are you, sir? <laughs> he said, how are you? He's doing good. Uh, Man. He can't hear you. Yes, I understand. <laughs> wow. Matt Hume will never come on my show. I try to get him on the show all the time. This is the one and only time I could get him. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. You're welcome. DJ, how's it going? Long time no speak. And great to ha great to see you. I feel like I never get to see you. Yeah, man. I think it's good. been busy working. Just got back home from Japan and, uh, you know, get rid of my uh, competition. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. But first, I'm dying to talk to you about what happened last uh, last Saturday, two Saturdays ago in Brooklyn. Did you watch the fight live, Henry Cejudo and TJ Dillshaw, the first UFC flyweight title that didn't involve you? I did not. I was busy filming with uh, Rusi kid. Uh, Rusi. What? Who's that? You don't know who Rusi is? Oh, man, you guys are looking up. He's a uh, basic eight-year-old stud, Japanese. Uh, his you know, idol is Bruce Lee. And so he's been doing workout videos and him doing choreography, uh, martial art his whole entire life. So he's a stud. Okay. So you didn't watch a live. Have you seen it since? I mean, it's a very short fight. Have you seen the fight since? I've seen it uh, uh, via Instagram. Yes, because it can't fit in the one minute. What do you think of the stoppage? Uh, you know, it's almost like it is what it is, right? I mean, obviously, TJ has been dropped before. In his previous fights against uh, Cody Nola. And uh, that's the thing. It's up to the ref to, it, it's his decision. So obviously he felt that it was right to stop. He didn't want to see TJ take any more damage. And it is what it is. Okay, don't give me the DJ media answer here. Give me the real Demetrius Johnson answer here. Was it not weird to see a UFC flyweight title fight happen without you? It had to be a little weird, right? No, not at all. Um, one of the things my sister and a lot of people tell me is that I'm not emotionally attached to... Uh, I wasn't emotionally attached to the belt. Once I lost it, it was it was it was done. I wasn't a part of that division anymore. I moved on to you know one championship, something that's bigger and better in my personal opinion. And uh, you know it, it wasn't weird at all. Like when it happened, it was I was almost happy for those guys getting that spotlight to be able to headline the ESPN, especially you know the talks with the UFC getting rid of the flyweight division. How could you be so unemotionally attached to something that was such a big part of your life that represented you that, that, that you were the face of for so long? That's the one thing that I can't understand. Well, it's, it's, it's just how I've always been. You know, I, I would go there and defend my title and then come back home and get ready for the next one. So the same thing. I lost that fight and, you know, you move on and you start uh, working on other things. Stop were you, the camera. I, I'm sorry. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Were you rooting for Henry? Uh, I was rooting for the best man. Okay. Best men. Obviously, they're both they're both great athletes, and I always want to see the best athlete win, the best fighter win. Don't you think it's a little weird that they're even considering getting rid of the flyweights? I mean, Henry's doing a good job, right? He's entertaining. He just beat the bantamweight champion. Will a part of you feel a little sad if they get rid of this weight class that you helped build? No, not at all, because that's, that's, that's their deal. I mean, at the end of the day, they've been talking about getting rid of that weight class when I was a champion. Yeah. <laughs> Defend, <laughs> defending the belt, so I'm not a part of it anymore, right? It's one of the best divisions. You know, you, you look at it skill-wise, technique-wise, cardio-wise, I mean, just everything. I mean, we have it. You know, the flyweights, they don't get tired. So is it because you want to give it because it's not generating any money? They just say that. Just say, hey, you know what? The flyweight division has been here a long time. It's not making us any money at all. We're going to get rid of it. And, and I mean, look, I mean, look at that. Look at, look at me do my work. Look yes. at that. Take down by the girl. Oh, and the, oh, oh, and nobody's seen this before. Oh, and, mm, look at that. Oh, look at that. Oh, oh everybody. Mm, look at that. Two flexes. Oh, but that's probably the mighty words. Shout out to that team for teaching me that. Actually doing it to me. That's how I taught, learned it. But I mean, it's very unfortunate. And then there's not going to be another division like that. You're going to see action like that. So, hey, you know what? They get rid of it. It's their loss. 
And for those who are just listening to the show, that was DJ reacting to some of his finer moments inside the octagon. <laughs> it was just a lot of ooing and aahing. But yes, you can appreciate your own work. You deserve it. Now, I, I heard you say that you're onto something bigger and better. Why do you feel like one is bigger and better for you? I feel like it embodies everything that I'm about in mixed martial arts. You know, the honor, respect, discipline, integrity. I mean, the flyweight title uh, trilogy just happened uh, last Saturday, June 25th, against Adriano Moraes versus J.H. Distacchio. Uh, an amazing fight. And after the fight was done, uh, both athletes came together, laid the belt on the ground, and bowed. And won championship. They loved that, and they were saying that this is what one's about, and that's what Chatri Chitonthong wants to represent is that we're about respect, honor, discipline. And throughout my whole entire career in mixed martial arts, I've always been a respectful athlete, uh, showing my opponent, you know, respect and letting everybody know, like, a fight's a fight, anything can happen. And, you know, I, I just love, it, love that about one championship. Do you feel more comfortable now that there's not all this pressure on you to sell pay-per-views and things like that? You could just focus on being yourself and being the best fighter that you can be? 100%. 100%. Uh, Chatri and everybody at one championship, they said the biggest thing we want is authentic, uh, authenticity. And so, I mean, that's what I always try to do is just be authentic. This must be like a breath of fresh air for you. Like, gosh, what, what a load off, right? I mean, what, what, what a, you know, just to not have to go out and try to sell pay-per-views and just be yourself. This is what you've always wanted. Pretty much. Look at that. Take that, here, Sue. Take that fighting kick. <laughs> I mean, d- yeah, so it's been good, man. Good. Can, can we just? I, I feel like you're really. I, I appreciate you doing this. You're really highlighting the, uh, the 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 upgraded production values that we have to the show right now. You like these different camera angles, right? Someone like you who works online a lot, you appreciate this, right? This is what you're missing out when you do the phone, do the interviews via phone. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I don't use Skype. I use Discord. Discord's a new uh, wave oh. of uh, communication when it comes to video game and. Uh, doing conference calls so this is this is a step up and, and good for you man you deserve it you're the best in the business when it comes to reporting mixed martial arts we gotta get you uh, reporting more one championship stuff okay fair enough um i i know that you were out there in uh in japan because it's a big deal for them to come out to the japan uh for the first time what what did they have you doing over there and did you feel like there was because i remember when i was in japan for ufc 144 it was amazing to me how little interest in MMA there was over there when of course back in the day pride it was so popular what did you feel in terms of the interest in the sport in Japan these days well obviously right now there's been a recession well a couple of years ago there's been a recession in mixed martial arts in Japan with just a I don't want to say the financial market but just the economy itself and so now you have Ryzen doing a good job trying to get the mixed martial arts back there Kyoji's over there doing a good job and now with Japan coming up with the stat head to toe card uh, it, the buzz is getting pretty high over there. I mean, they're very excited for one championship. I mean, I just found out today that Bibiana Fernandez is going to be on the card, uh, Giorgio Petrosian, and Yosan Klai is going to be on the card too. Yo, yo, Yosan Klai's on the card, so we got some uh, kickboxing on there as well. So it's going to be pretty sick. The fans out there, the pump. Eddie Alvarez is coming back, so it's going to be lit. Did Did you feel like a lot of people knew who you were, knew about your oh your past? Yeah, they were knowledgeable. Oh yeah, one hundred. One hundred percent. They're like, "Oh, give me your son. Oh, <laughs> welcome." When we, we, we heard you coming over uh, to one championship, we're like, "No way!" And you know, even when I was in uh, the UFC, uh, Saki Kabara, the president for uh, Ryzen, was like, "Please, when you're done with UFC, come come fight for me, please, please." And I said, "Well, we'll see what happens." But now I'm gonna be able to come over to uh, Japan and compete for one championship, and I'm super excited. Why does it seem like in Asia there is more of an appreciation for the smaller weight classes, in your opinion? Well, Shuto has been going on forever, as far as I know. And Shuto is based around lighter weight fighters. And Shuto is a huge stable there in Japan. And so it's always been, you know, a thing for them to like the small athletes, the smaller weight classes. Anytime someone talks about your move to one, they, they do bring up... Uh, Matt Hume, who we just saw, who's the vice president over there. How how mm-hmm. how does that work? Because I would imagine, I mean, he's been your head coach forever. We know about your relationship, but could there be a conflict of interest there? How, how do you separate the two? But you know, between him being your coach, but also being an executive for one. Yeah. So obviously, he's been my coach since the day I started doing mixed martial arts. And the biggest thing is that he will no longer be in my corner when I compete which is something I'm going to have to get used to. Wow. Uh, obviously, we can train. When I go over there to, you know, compete, if I'm in the hotel room, we can't 
have any, you know, uh, communication. You can't help me work out anymore during fight week. So it, it's definitely going to be a change for me as an athlete and, you know, as a student. But it is what it is. And I'm looking forward to the future. And, you know, Matt said, hey, you know what? My job is to get you ready as best I can. And you got to go out there and do your thing. And I told him, I was like, all right, now if I go out there and get my ass beat, I don't want to hear nothing when we come back to the gym. I'm like, dude, she did this. Like, you weren't there, Matt. So it, it, it's, it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Wow. Well, when's the last time you had a fight where he wasn't in your corner, if ever? <laughs> I feel the last time Matt was in my corner was when I fought amateur and I broke my hand in the first round. Oh, no. And then I end up finishing the guy the third round. And then I called Matt uh, that night and he goes, how was the fight? And I was like, oh, I broke my hand. I'm going to get surgery on Monday, but I got to go back to work. I was doing how it goes. So it's been a long time. Wow. Uh, do you feel any, because because so much has been made about your connection, how he throws out instructions, you do it on command, the Horiguchi fight, the Ray Borg fight, et cetera, et cetera. How do you feel about this? Are you uneasy about this? Uh, you know, deep down inside, I'm, I'm a little nervous, nervous about it. But I feel there's a point in time when Matt, when he was training and when he was competing, he would go into his company petitions with you know his training partners in the corner and he'll go out there and do what he needs to do so for me uh mentally i need to go out there and do what i need to do and remember all the training that matt you know put me through up to that point that's how i feel emotionally and mentally about it so i mean you just imagine like that's been what been making me good all these years that me and matt had this yin yang like it's like a video game matt's like do this do this and i'm like boop, boop, boop. i'm doing it so now i just gotta go out there and do it. Wow. So who's your head coach when you're actually fighting? <laughs> what happened? What'd I miss? What happened? What's so funny? Matt was just, Matt was like, what was that? What is it? His mind. That's what he said. Okay. Um, so who's your head coach when you fight? Brad? Uh, you know, Brad won't be making it out to this one because he has uh, um, a, a child on the way. So okay. he won't be able to make it out. So, uh, who's going to be my corner? He's going to be my longtime training partner, James Yang. Um, I call him Iron Fist. And my other training partner, Tony Sublime, is going to be my corner. So, I mean, we trained together. I mean, he was there for the Henry Cejudo fight. And it's going to work out. You know, I, I'm, I'm confident in my skill set. I'm confident in my training. I'm confident that Matt will make sure I am fully prepared to go out there and, you know, be the best that I can be. Did you know about this when you signed with them, that he wouldn't be able to be in your corner? Um. We we thought that he would be able to because it, it's not it, it's no secret, right? <clears throat> you know, I've been with Matt since the beginning of my mixed martial arts career, so it's not like I just signed up at AMC and I just started training with Matt and then I got signed for one championship. You know, I've I've got I, I think thirty amateur fights underneath AMC Pink Creation, and then I got six years as a champion underneath AMC Pink Creation as my head coach Matt Hume, and then nine to one championship. So we figured it would be okay, but then you know when we sit down and work to the logistics of it, they're like you know. It's probably best that, you know, conflict of interest that, you know, Matt's on your corner. And, you know, when it comes to me getting booked in my fights and my bad agreements, I believe Matt has nothing to do with it. Uh, there's another person who's in charge of that. And, you know, he sent to me, he sent to me and Matt the bad agreement that one championship wants to offer me. And, you know, that's how this bad agreement went with uh, Yuya Wakamatsu. Yeah. Uh, how much do you know about Wakamatsu? Uh, Wakamatsu, uh, great Japanese athlete. Um, he's got a lot of finishes, a uh, TKL knockout artist. So he's a dangerous opponent. I'm looking forward to it. Are you hoping get rid of the flyweight division, sign Henry Cejudo trilogy in one? Is that what you're hoping for? But, but I'm, I, what I'm hoping for is I win this tournament. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm, I'm hoping to uh, stay healthy and then depend on whatever the UFC wants to do with the flyweight division. And <clears throat> I know Chachri and uh, Henry Cejudo, they, uh, they have a relationship. So I wouldn't be surprised if they get rid of the division um, Henry Cejudo comes over the one championship, and then uh, if I become the champion, then uh, we can uh, do it up again. Wow, wouldn't that be something? Because yeah, Henry has hinted at this in the past as well that if things go don't go well with the division, that he'd be able to leave and go to somewhere like one. You know this, right? Yeah, of course, of course, I know this. Wow. So, uh, so how big of a possibility is it? You've got the inside track over there. Do you feel like this could actually happen in 2019? I mean, it all depends what the UFC wants to do. I mean, obviously, you know, Henry Cejudo, he's technically, you know, he just beat uh, TJ Doshaw by knockout, so he can go up to 135 and beat TJ there. I think it, it's definitely possible uh, that he can be, you know, champ champ, 125, 135, and he could be the champ at 135. And let's say he stays there, defensive belt at 135, two or three times, 
and then he loses and he's like, you know, I'm gonna go to one championship if I'm still over here, then it's anything's possible in this sport of mixed martial arts, especially when you're trying to get rid of a division that, you know, you have a champion in. So I, I can tell that Hamish is a smart business yeah. man. He's not gonna wait, a, you know, if they're gonna give a division. I mean, there's so many possibilities. You have seen like, you know, we have right to your contract and you're gonna, I mean, there's so much that can happen. Well, next up for you, DJ, and I think if anyone's worried or wondering, life is good for Demetrius Johnson. He's 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 not thinking about the past. He's moved on. He's not worried about the past. He's fighting Yuya Wakamatsu in the first round of the flyweight tournament for one. And by the way, how much do you weigh in at there when you when you weigh in for this fight? How much you have to weigh? I'll weigh in 135 pounds, fully hydrated. So wow. it's it's, it's definitely a different change. I would have to lose an extra 10 pounds to be dehydrated when I make 125. Like, I think truly deep down inside, I can make 125 fully hydrated, but I don't want to go through that. Like, you know, when I saw what TJ went through to make 125, I was like, nope, nope, I ain't about that life anymore, dog. I, ain't going to happen anymore. Wow. What a change. This is amazing stuff. March 31st is debut for one championship. Thanks for doing this, DJ, especially via Skype. I know it's not that fancy new video thing you kids talk about, but uh, I know it's a big deal because you're always kids. very resistant to Skype. So Wait, who are you calling great. a kid? I, I got three children. I'm 32 years old. Tim <laughs> old Bill's calling me a kid. Come on now. Uh, well, you look great, and I'm happy to see you. I appreciate it as always, and uh, good. I'm sure I'll talk to you before then, but good luck in training for the fight. Absolutely, Ariel. Thank you, man, and uh, congrats on everything. Uh, congrats on all your recent success, okay? Thank you. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. We'll talk to you soon. There he is, the one and only Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson, former UFC flyweight champion, now a part of one's flyweight tournament. Okay, what a fun day. A little hectic at times, but we got it done. Corporate Jake, you can hit my music. Woo-wee. We got a lot more to do today, my friends, because after this, in case you don't know, we then prepare for our TV show. Like I said, 1 a.m. Eastern time on ESPN2, 10 p.m. Pacific. It's a condensed version of this show, but it's also a show that presents some new little trinkets for you. So definitely tune in. And if you can't stay up, definitely DVR it. It's been a fun day, my friends. I want to thank everyone who tuned in. I want to thank everyone who stopped by. All the guests, all of them, even the ones who were late, even the ones with the questionable Skype connections. It was great to have you all on the program today. Let me find the uh, the lineup. Where is it? I don't have the lineup. Oh, there it is. All right. Um, yes, Ryan Bader. What a great performance from him on Saturday, knocking out Fyodor Emelianenko in just 35 seconds with the same left hook. Wow. Same left hook that he knocked out King Mo in just 15 seconds. Who would have thought? Ryan Bader, double champ, Bellator. He got three belts on Saturday. Incredible stuff. Thank you very much, Ryan Bader, for stopping by. Thank you very much to Jake Hager, a.k.a. Jack Swagger. Congrats on the victory. Good luck to Fabrizio Verdun with his meeting in the UFC. Thank you very much to Justin Gaethje. Good luck to him. March 30th, Philadelphia. Thank you very much to Holly Holm. Good luck to her. March 2nd in Las Vegas against Aspen Ladd. Thank you very much to Jorge Masvidal and Darren Till. Good luck to them on March 16th. Thank you very much, Henry Krause. Congratulations and thank you to Demetrius Johnson. Back next week, same time and place. Until I say peace, I'm out of here.